just if someone applies between now and then, they don't have anything available for you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our uh, December 5th uh, council meeting. Welcome to December. Uh, in, so I'd like to go ahead and call to order our meeting with the invocation and pledge uh, led by Ms. Powers. Let us pray silently together, each one of us, according to our individual beliefs. Let us offer thanks for the blessings around us. Let us be a source of hope for those in need and contentment for those who are lonely. Let us give gratitude for our opportunity to serve the city of Gehanna. Let the feelings of love, kindness, and a well-directed yet gentle spirit always be reflected in our actions. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Jeremy, can you please call a roll? Angelou? Here. Bowers? Here. McGregor? Here. Padova? Here. Renner? Here. Schnetzer? Here. Weaver? Here. All right, thank you. 
Item B, additions or corrections to our agenda. Do I have anything uh, tonight? All right, seeing none, we'll go uh, to a hearing of visitors. Mayor, yeah, I believe you have a proclamation. I do, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so between the period between Thanksgiving and New Year's obviously is a holiday time for us. It's a time when everybody's excited to travel, go visit family and friends, uh, travel whether that's out of state or even just locally. Uh, but December also is a time of year that is proven to be the most deadly uh, because December is the time, the period from Thanksgiving to New Year's Eve is the time when we see uh, the most impaired driving circumstances happening. Uh, and actually, I would like to invite, we have a member of um, MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, with us, Mr. Doug Scholes, who is the Regional Executive Director uh, for MAD with us this evening. Um, I just want to give some statistics, because uh, I think they're uh, really significant. Um, Alcohol-impaired driving crashes, which range from being under the influence of substances to distractive driving to speeding, increase throughout December. Generally, there are 338,000 injuries per year due to impaired driving. 43.6% of fatally injured drivers tested positive for drugs. 11,654 people were killed in impaired driving crashes in 2020. And 4,300 of those killed were under the age of 21. So for more than 40 years, preventionists have sought to recognize December as national, I'm going to get it right because there's a lot of words, National Impaired Driving Prevention Month. Uh, and it really is to drive attention to the fact that we need to be careful on the roads. We need to implement strategies uh, so that people can not only go out and enjoy themselves but come back home safely and that others who are on the road are safe, traveling safely as well. And do you want to add anything, Doug, as, as well to that point? I think that's well said. Um, I want to also say that we can pass all the laws in the world and the public awareness programs without officers, committed officers on the road detecting alcohol impairment or drug impairment and removing those drivers off the road, we are always going to have a problem. So NAD, for one, recognizes and acknowledges the efforts and commitment we have of outstanding officers like we have here tonight. Which brings us, so I do have a proclamation that we'll post on the website just recognizing National Impaired Driving Prevention Month. We're happy to take that with you in the MAD offices Thank if you'd you. like. Um, but we're also here to recognize one of, our, one of our Gehanna's finest officers, Officer Jeff Hoffman, who later this week will actually attend a MAD luncheon uh, to receive the 2022 Award of Excellence for his work in enforcing our roadways uh, and, the, and in the arrest of impaired drivers. Uh, just some statistics for Officer Hoffman. Um, so far this year, through the month of November, 33 OVI arrests, uh, which is, I want to get this correct, 27, accounting for 27% of all OVI arrests on his shift and 21% of all OVI arrests division wide. And he is on track to be, for the second year, uh, to have the highest uh, number of OVI arrests. And, just to show the impact that he is having on our Gahanna community. Due in large part to his initiative and his focus on traffic safety, the division made 157 total OVI arrests in 2022 through November, which is up from 134 during the same time last year. It's a 17% increase through the month of November so far this year. So Officer Hoffman, we do have, I'm gonna invite Chief Spence to come over here and present you with a core value award in recognition of your work. And Chief, I'll let you do that. Thank you. And uh, our, our core value awards go out uh, typically for officers that display one of our four core values. In this case, it's uh, commitment of, of uh, Jeff's uh, work and his, um, uh, really he's uh, a steadfast enforcer of, of traffic law, but he's, he's really helping save lives out there. It's a, it's a very dangerous environment that we found ourselves, especially uh, over, the, over these last several months. Uh, the traffic volume really has returned to normal from, uh, pre from, from the pandemic, but it, there was a lot less congestion on our roadways, a lot less impaired driving. So with that, um, core value work. Do you have, this is like being at the Oscars. We have to take your picture. Where do you want to go, Chief? 
right in front of the podium. Doug, come on in here. There, that's quick and painless. Oh, <laughs> one, two, three, fall. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Doug. Doug. Thank you. Yes, we'll see. I'll see you Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, members of the public, I do have uh, speaker slips. Uh, so when I, per our rules, if I call your name, please come to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes uh, to speak. Uh, Bob Schultz. Hello, Bob Schultz. I live at 130 John Drive. Um, the reason why I'm here is I would like to have the city council Beware of a parking issue that we're having on our street due to, I don't know if it's uh, because of money or what, but we used to have a signs that said no parking 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on school days. Since those signs have been taken down when they redid the sidewalks and the streets, our corner there at Gary Lee and John have been inundated with students' cars. There are several times where we've had incidents. You can't get in our driveway. They're parking too close to driveways. Um, they're throwing trash in my yard, which I pick up daily. Um, they're being disrespectful to the residents. Um, I feel that something should be done about it. I would like to see the signs put back up, but there's no parking 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. school days that were there prior two years, three years ago when they redid the roads, the streets, um, it's, it's getting out of hand. We've had incidents with other neighbors, with parents, and I, I just, I don't see a good thing happening out of this. I mean, I could care less, you know, who parks there. It's just, we need some kind of rules because they're parking bumper to bumper, over sticking our driveways. Apparently, I'm not bad mouthing the police department, but apparently warnings or tickets aren't being written like they should be. I mean, I know it's on the books. I'm sure it's a three foot distance from the apron of your driveway, but we just gotta do something. I mean, it's every day. Every day from 7.30 until probably four o'clock. You can't get in and out of our street without having to stop because there's cars on both sides across from each other. And, you know, I, I just feel something needs to be done. I don't know if it needs to be one side parking or just put the signs back up. I mean, you know, I, I don't know what the best solution is, but I just don't know why the signs were taken down after they redid the streets. They were there, they put the new sidewalks, new streets up, in, and the signs are gone. Now everybody parks there. And like I said, it's right there at the corner, so it's hard to get in and out. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that I have other speaker slips from uh, people that want to speak to uh, John Drive issue. That's such a small street. Um, Mayor, did you have somebody you want to... If I could, please, thank you, because Chief Spence and I actually just had a conversation about John Drive today. Um, so, uh, Chief, uh, and I'll, I'll let Chief speak to kind of some of the parameters and, uh, and issues around signs. However, we spoke earlier today because I was on your street, and they were parked on both sides of the street, um, and it was very difficult to get through. Um, and... Uh, I had a conversation with Chief, and then he was going out to, to take a look at it. So our plan is to put signs up one side of the street again. I can't really speak to why they were taken down before, but maybe Chief has some additional insights on that. So I'm going to turn it to Chief Spence. So uh, do, you, do you want to I don't it? have a speaker slip for you. Oh, I do have a speaker slip. <laughs> Well, um, all right, so the chief would like to speak to this issue. Um, if, do you want to add to it? Please come forward. 
Ms. Bates, can you please come to the... Good evening, Chief, members of council, and the mayor. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. And I'm glad that you were there. Thanks. Well, we're here mainly. We've, we've been putting up with all the garbage. We've had uh, a student run down the street recently. A dog bolted out of a, pair, or out of a, out of a home. They hit the dog, the dog rolled under the, <laughs> the wheel of the car, the car kept on going, killed the guy's dog, and kept on going. So now we have an incident that is serious enough for everybody and the chief to pay attention to because we're scared, we're worried. One of the students blocked one of our neighbor's driveway. The neighbor went out and he put a sign on the front of the car on the windshield and said, if you block me tomorrow, I'm gonna to have your car towed. That evening, he's out mowing his grass. A man came running up into his, onto his property, screaming and, and waving his paper in the air and wanted to know if he blankety, blankety, blank, put that piece of paper on that car, and my neighbor said yes. He continued on threatening him with assault. My neighbor said, and he's not here, and I'm not gonna mention names, that if it had to be, I mean, it, I would have hoped that he would have called the police, okay. and he would have done something, about, they, the, it would have been a police incident then, but he chose not to. That being said, he goes back into the house the next morning. Now that's a parent. We've got parents coming into our neighborhood and threatening the neighbors on, on their rights. I mean, these students have impeded our, real, our lifestyle. If you want to have any service done to your house, like I had a roof put on the house, you know what I have to do? Get up at seven o'clock in the morning, be out there on the street and, and cordially ask the students, would you mind not parking here today because I'm gonna have workers and stuff here? I mean, I, we can't have visitors. So to go on with the story of my neighbor, which is the real reason all of us have come, is the next day, this student boldly pulls up to his driveway again and of course, everybody's got ring doorbells so we can see what's going on, right? And so he pulls up, gets out of his car, looks to make sure he's within that, what parameter it was, gets back in the car, rams up the engine, this is 7.30, quarter to late in the morning, and is, turns up the music real loud, and it's, and it's really kind of intimidating, not to him, but to all of us. I mean, we don't need it. I mean, we just don't need it. And so we're really pleading for those signs to go back up. I mean, we're finding everything from garbage. They, get, they eat their lunch and kick it out of the door. You know, people, our neighborhood's beautiful. It's an old neighborhood. We've got sidewalks. We're out there walking. We have, now we have young families because the neighborhood's turning over. You know, we're finding used condoms. On, the, on our street, it's really disgusting. If, you know, it, and this is what we have been putting up with until this incident happened. And so I'm almost afraid now to speak publicly on the issue because I don't want to be faced with reprisal. All of us are, have concerns now because you've got a parent. The kids are bad enough. But when you've got a parent, had that been other people that I know, we would have been in the newspaper to last, last month. We would have been in a newspaper because I have no, I know neighbors and I have friends that are carrying guns. And just about the time you're running up on my property and this, calling me expletives and telling me what you're going to do to me, you might not be you might be getting carried out of that yard. 
So it's just it's just a situation that has is 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 really it needs needs. And so if okay. you're going to put up the signs, thank you. Thank you, Miss Bates. So, Chief, would you like to? address this situation because it sounds like there's a lot of stuff going on. Chief, can, can I just add one more thing before before you make a comment? Um, thank you very much for sharing your experience. I, well, if, if I could, I, I just want to let you know, uh, we have one of our school board members, Daphne Mooring, is sitting right behind you. Uh, and, I, and I'll let uh, Chief, Chief Spence speak to the sign issue. Uh, as I said, we spoke about that today. But I will also reach out to the superintendent tomorrow uh, and relay your, your comments to her as well. And we'll work together with her. Thank you, so much. Thank you Chief. From a historical perspective, going back to the signage on that roadway, uh, and specifically in that neighborhood, uh, as that um, road project began, I'm, I'm not sure, it's probably dating back, I believe, to around 2019 time frame when it was first proposed, maybe 2018. Uh, a lot of the signage uh, that was installed wasn't installed properly or per code. There were various signs that were not supported in code. For example, no school student parking. We do not have any uh, mechanism in our code. Uh, similar, and I'll use Columbus as an example, where they have parking zones in the short north, where they have resident parking. They get a uh, sticker that's, that's specifically for residents. We don't have that, that vehicle, that mechanism in, in code. So there are some things that were related to the, the postings of those signs. Uh, for, for whatever reason, from a historical perspective, we couldn't find um, the, the documentation of when the various signs were put up. Uh, some were two hour parking, some were um, no parking within certain hours, which can be restricted. Um, but we also ran across several residents that uh, complained uh, that one side of the park, one side of the street was uh, no parking, other sides weren't, that because they lived there, they should be able to park there because they weren't a student. So it became sort of a little bit of a hodgepodge of, of um, various reasons. So when those, those signs were uh, taken out related to the road construction project, uh, yeah, the fact they were not reinstalled. Um, we are now seeing with the construction related to the high school, I think that's starting to push students out into the neighborhoods. We're seeing it not only um, in Gary Lee and Jan Drive and that, that area, but also other, other surrounding streets uh, from the high school. And as construction continues, I imagine that will, that will continue um, to get worse. When it comes to parking complaints in general, they're, they're complaint-based. It's a call in to us. We're not actively looking, uh, unless it's a, an egregious violation, we're not out um, you know, from, a, from a parking enforcement perspective. That's, that it, it is primarily complaint-based from our response. Um, so uh, we did uh, look at, and, and the situation has, has gotten exponentially worse as, these, uh, as the construction continues and more students are pushed out farther into the neighborhoods. With that, I believe the, you know, we, are, we are prepared to uh, do the correct um, sign process and uh, no park uh, those streets on the hydrant side uh, of the roadway. Again, there, so we're clear, there is no permit parking mechanism in Gahanna. So if there's somebody that's legally parked on the street, it is a public street. It, we can't differentiate between, is it a resident, is it a non-resident, do they, do they have business there, are they visiting somewhere, or are they going to school there? We can certainly work with the school to try to educate those students and make sure they're not uh, creating a hindrance on a roadway. There are things, and, and again, if, there, if there's a violation, if the vehicle is in fact obstructing a driveway, if it's obstructing uh, the egress uh, from, from a private drive, that in fact is a violation, uh, and we can take action. I would encourage you to call us, and we will send somebody out, and we will handle the, handle the violation. We do not tow, <coughs> and there's not a mechanism for impounding a vehicle uh, strictly for a parking violation. There are some exceptions, but we would simply issue a citation in that in that manner. We wouldn't, we can't 
re forcibly remove the vehicle. Any any questions on the? Yes. Ms. Bates, can you come to the microphone to for thank you? I heard everything that you said, Chief, but I didn't hear anything that was you know going to help us. I mean, unless you guys come out and figure out what can help us. Awesome. But what I do know is behind, I live at 100, so at like 96 or 98, I, I, my yard backs up to Frazier, up in the front on Hamilton Road. Next to that, the school owns the property, and that must be an acre or acre and a half of land. And that Lustron house is sitting on there. It's been there for years. I uh, tr tr tried to get the Historical Society to take that at some point in my life, working on community projects in Gahanna. But that's a lot of land over there that the school owns. But I noticed that recently a no parking sign went up on that piece of land. They have a driveway. They have, a, they have an entrance in there. And someone had been or was working with the school in the Lustron building. So I'm, what I'm wondering is, if you wanted to have overflow parking and you're not aware of what I, I live in the area, so I'm seeing a lot. I'm thinking if you had to have overflow parking, and I mean, I don't see a reason for us to have this, as you say, pushed out into the neighborhoods, that's going to let, let, you know, how long is that going to go? Two, two to three years now, we got 2,500 students. We're going to have 5,000 students soon. I mean, what is going to be the answer for us for a, a neighborhood that, that really works? We're not the short north. We're just a so, little. So, Ms. Bates, if I could, I don't mean to cut you off, but the hearing of visitors is actually about bringing issues before council. I think you've okay. done just that. You've asked the question about what can happen. I heard the chief say that you can call. Chief, what's the phone number for the police department? 342-4240. 614-342-4240. That is a very active response that the, uh, that the city could actually do in the long term. I mean, the short term. Long term, we can look at, you know, putting the, uh, as the chief talked about, putting the signs back up on one side of the street. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I do have more uh, speaker slips. Um, Sherry McMaster. Good evening. I basically have the same issue. Uh, we live at 122 Jan Drive, and we literally have two cars blocking the driveway on the opposite side of the road, two cars on each side of the driveway, so when I try to back out, it's having to do a maneuver to go either way. And I almost hit a couple of the cars a couple times, but we really just want the sign to be put back up. And you said it was gonna be on one side of the street. Is that for sure? Or is that just something that you're looking at? We typically no park the hydrant side of the street unless there are environmental conditions that we would switch that we would have to evaluate that again we work with the fire department in terms of uh how those signs are positioned and then we get with our service department there's a sign process so that that's that's in process we were we've already discussed it we discussed it earlier today i'm just saying from a from a practical standpoint generally we no park the hydrant side of the of the roadway okay so if you're right and that would help because yeah. that would only be at least you have one side you could get out on. Yeah. And that's pretty much all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, the final one is Betsy, I'm sorry, Tartle. I have a piece of paper here that I was going to say, but good evening. And I like what you say, Chief. Ms. Tartle, can you, I'm so sorry, for the record, can you ask you to state your name and oh, the address? Uh, Betsy Tartle, T-A-R-T-A-L, 146 Gary Lee Drive, Gahanna. I love Gahanna, and I love what the chief said, and I love what the mayor said. And I trust them that they will do it.
because we live here and we like Gehenna and we want it to grow. And the children, we've all had, we've been teenagers before, all of us here. And sometimes they are a little uh, uh, ranxious, a little uh, shenanigans. They're just shenanigans. They don't mean, but sometimes you have to give respect to get respect. And these children are our future. And I think you people will do the best thing you can. Thank you, Mayor. I don't need my list. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mayor, just to tie a bow on this discussion since it became a major discussion, um, we heard what residents can actually do in the short term if there's an incident and definitely call the police department. What's the long term uh, and what needs to happen in order for the signs to get back up? Sure. Actually, I know Chief Spencer and I will follow up together tomorrow. He, uh, as I said, I happened to go down that street today and uh, we had a conversation this afternoon. Um, Chief, I know you were going to go out and take a look at it. Yes, sir. Just, just as I said, uh, we, we, we look at the roadway. Generally speaking, the, the rule of thumb is we no park the, uh, the hydrant side. There are some, some situations that it might deviate from that. Just depends, especially with curvatures of the roadways and, and things like that. We'll, we'll evaluate the roadway. We always check with the fire <coughs> department because there are certain things uh, related to their, uh, their equipment that we always uh, check the block. We then uh, create a, uh, uh, an order of signage. It goes through a um, signature process, and we send it over to the service department, and then it, they, uh, in fact, install the signs. We'll take photographs of the area and, and work on placement. Okay, and I don't want to put you or the mayor or anybody in a uh, position, but yeah. what's the time frame? Time frame. What's the expected time? Uh, a, a few weeks. I, I think before... Certainly before the students get back into uh, in a session, uh, I don't know that we'll have it before the before the winter break. We've got some holidays coming up, uh, but we'll, we'll again it, it shouldn't take us but a, a couple of days to get the the process completed and get the uh, and then depending on turnover for the sign maker. Yes, yeah. that's. You know, I believe that that's a school board issue, and then you should actually bring it up at the next school board meeting or, or contact one of the five members of uh, school board. So uh, I think it's an excellent question. But again, um, I think to reiterate, 614-342-4240, uh, that's your best number to call uh, for incidents, okay? Uh, are there any other um, uh, speaker slips? Absolutely. Please, please come forward and, in fact, you look like a student, so. Um, so my name's Kaden Pellerino. I'm a senior at Gehanna Lincoln High School, and I hear you guys talking about the parking issue, and I just want to say, like, something should be addressed to the school with you guys, um, because since the construction started this year, there has been no parking for any of us. We're having to park miles away at churches. And I think something should be said with the school just to figure out the parking. And I think the school should take more control in the parking situation because in the morning it is so bad for people trying to even get through the school parking lot, like 20 minutes behind. So I think something should be done with the parking situation. So thank you. Thank you very much for actually having the courage to stand up. Um, I also, I would actually... Uh, move you to actually connect with one of the school board members that is here in the audience, uh, as the mayor said, and uh, please capture her before she leaves. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, I don't have any, are there anybody else that wants to speak? All right, moving on, uh, public um, item D, we have a public hearing. Uh, we want to turn our attention to the budget uh, for next year. The public hearing uh, is a way that we actually provide uh, the public access and ability to speak. 
Um, as published, uh, we do have rules, and so I'm going to read those uh, for you for everybody's edification. Pursuant, pursuant to Council Rules 9.20.1, finance hearings uh, being a special circumstance shall have the following rules. Speakers sh uh, speaker shall have five minutes to speak on increases or additions on an item. Speakers shall have five minutes to speak on reductions or removal of an item or speakers shall have three minutes to speak on general comments. Okay, so if you're for adding something, you get five minutes. If you're for reducing something, you get five minutes. And if you wanna just speak in general, you get three minutes. All right, I wanna open the comment period. And so I'm gonna ask for any speakers. Do we have anybody who wants to speak for an addition or an increase? Yes, sir. For our rules, I think you know. State your name and address for the record. Um, my name is Max Orsley. I reside at 691 Vivian Court. Hello, Council. I would like to voice support in increasing our parks budget, particularly when it comes to the matter of transportation around our city by means other than car. I think it could benefit all of us, in particular with the conversation tonight about parking and everyone needing to get to a single place to have multiple forms of transportation, not just driving, be it transportation through bus. Um, we are a city of 35,000 people. I think we could have a rail of some form and of course, walking and bicycling. That's all I have to say about support. Thank you for your comments. All right, moving on. Uh, are there any additional speakers for uh, additions or increases to our budget? Okay, um, how about speakers to reductions or removal of items in our budget? I'll keep talking if you let me. <laughs> Max Orsley, 691 Vivian Court. The only thing I saw particularly paying attention this year to our city council meetings and the, the councils of the whole, um, are subsidies that go to businesses, particularly with the project, um, I can't remember that exact road, near Tech Center Drive South, um, where they wanna develop all that multifamily housing. They have this anonymous someone who's gonna provide uh, this employment this revenue to the city, won't say who. I'd like to see those kind of things be resolved more completely um, in a way that's transparent to the population that we know that they are going to make their commitment and not give them our tax abatements or give them money essentially um, for something that they're not delivering on guaranteed. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Just to be clear that you're talking about a process and a contract, uh, and that is not necessarily in the budget, but it is in when we'd actually talk about uh, uh, tax subsidies or what have you. So, okay. right, thank you. I wasn't sure if it fell. No, yeah, it, it's a good question, and thank you for the edification for everybody. All right, uh, any additional speakers on uh, removal or uh, subtractions from the budget? Maybe that's a timer for me to shut up. Um, all right, uh, how about any just general comments, uh, what have you, about the budget? Going once. All right. Thank you, everybody, for uh, your participation. Uh, if you have uh, questions or lingering uh, questions, don't forget. You can always reach out to any of seven of us or our mayor. Um, all right, moving on, item E, uh, the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda as published? So moved. Have a first by Mr. Snesser. Do I have a second? Second. Have a second by Ms. Bowers. Any discussion? All right, Jeremy, please call the roll. Schnetzer? Yes. Bowers? Yes. McGregor? Yes. Padova? Yes. Renner? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Angelou? Yes. A little fast there on the yes, sir. 
<laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate it. Uh, item F, motions. Uh, we do have one motion uh, to appoint uh, somebody to the Civil Service uh, Commission. Uh, the motion is MT19-2022, a motion to appoint uh, somebody to the Civil Service Commission seat two for the unexpired term ending December 31st, 2023. I'd like to ask, is there a motion uh, to appoint somebody. Yes, Mr. President. Ms. Bowers. I'd like to move to appoint Kylie Cooper Cyrus to the Civil Service Commission seat two for the unexpired term ending December 31, 2023. Okay, I have a first motion for Kylie Cooper Cyrus to fill the uh, vacated seat under civil service. Do I have a second? So moved. I have a second uh, by Ms. Padova. Thank you. All right, any discussion? I'll make a comment. Yes, please. I would just like to thank uh, those who applied to fill the roles uh, that were available um, recently for board and commission seats. Um, it's wonderful when we have an opportunity to interview candidates and uh, make a determination on, uh, on filling these important roles that serve the community. Um, the boards and commissions make up a large part of uh, some of the oversight and the function of local government. And so it's a great way for people to get involved uh, and to really learn how certain aspects of local government work. Um, so pe for people who may be interested or wanting to become more involved, um, it can be a very accessible way to do so um, on a limited time commitment. So I would encourage folks to keep their eyes open on um, the council, uh, council's website. There are also appointments made through the mayor's office and the mayor uh, also solicits applications uh, when, when those positions are available to be appointed through her office. Um, so thank you to those uh, who applied and uh, thank you to Ms. Cyrus for, for submitting her resume and interviewing with us. Thank you, any further discussion? All right, Jeremy, please call the roll on this motion to appoint Kylie Cooper Cyrus to the Civil Service Commission. Bowers? Yes. Padova? Yes. McGregor? Yes. Renner? Yes. Schnetzer? Yes. Weaver? Yes. Angelou? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, will you please contact her and yes. let her know? All right, uh, item G, ordinances for introduction, first reading. I'll read these for the record for introduction. Ordinance 73, 2022 an ordinance to amend official zoning map of the city of Gahanna adopted by ordinance 198-96 on November 19, 1996 and subsequently amended, changing the zoning district of plus minus 0.299 acres of 3.4 acre site located at 348 Granville Street, parcel ID 025-000276 from Suburban Office SO to Community Commercial CC, Project Castle 348 uh, Granville LLC, Matt Von Bargain Applicant. Wow. Uh, ordinance 74 2022, an ordinance to make appropriations for current expenses and other expenditures of the city of Gahanna, Ohio, during the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2023. Ordinance 76, 2022, an ordinance accepting a deed of easement of 0 .020 acres on parcel number 027-000110 from Value Recovery Group 2 LLC for the utility purpose associated with the Tech Center Drive extension. I have a question, uh, Mr. Merlarski. Yes, sir. I thought all Gahanna parcels were 025. This is 027. Are we sure that that's correct? It is. It's our planning director has stated. Uh, okay. If that's one of the parcels, that's Jefferson Township uh, Fire Department. Yes, that's what oh, I was saying. Jefferson, Jefferson Township, Township Fire. Yeah. So that, that's okay. Different than the ones coming All right. from Mifflin officially. Mrs. McGregor, thank you so much for that clarification. That caught me off guard a little bit. I'm glad I could help. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right. All right, item uh, H, correspondence and actions. Mr. Clerk, do you have anything? Nothing this evening. All right, thank you. How about my colleagues on council? Anything? 
All right, moving on. Uh, representatives, uh, Community Improvement Corporation, just want to reiterate uh, that uh, uh, we have a um, meeting together, uh, council and the CIC together on December 20th, uh, and that is at eight o'clock, and it'll be at the golf course. So don't forget. Or is it 7.30? 7.30. Thank you. Mayor. Mr. Weaven. Weaver. 7.30 uh, at the Senior Center. We okay. To, we had to relocate. <laughs> <laughs> Just this afternoon decided. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's what I was trying to remember. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so it's 7.30 at the Senior Center on December 20th. And again, uh, this will be the second time uh, that Council and CIC got together. And I really uh, applaud uh, leadership on CIC for actually proposing and pushing this forward. All right, uh, Mid Ohio Regional Planning Commission, Ms. Angelou. Thank you, sir. Um, the uh, on the December first, it was the uh, executive committee meeting, and uh, I am part of that. And we had many things to discuss that are going to be coming forward to this. Thursday when we have the, uh, the commission meeting. And uh, a few of them were things like budgets. We have a budget there as well. And again, and the public uh, policy agenda for 23-24 will come before uh, the <clears throat> commission to be passed. And I'm sure it will be passed and it was done well. And uh, we have uh, other resolutions, and we, we're, we'll, we will be getting the City of London as a member of the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, and that will be this Thursday. And I am pr very happy to say that um, Jeremy is going to be coming with me as my guest to the um, Thursday meeting, and I hope you enjoy it. You're going to be at 111 Liberty Street. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Convention and Visitors Bureau, Ms. Padova. Thank you. Um, the Visit Gehanna uh, hosted the Santa Race on Saturday, and there were over 300 participants um, who participated in that. I believe uh, Councilwoman Bowers was one of them. Um, so thank you to everybody who came out and um, participated and volunteered in that to make it successful. Um, the CVB also coordinated the Creekside Holiday Scavenger Hunt for the third year in a row here. Um, it will be taking place through December 23rd, and participants are eligible for um, prizes when they find 10 items on the list. Um, Gehanna, Gehanna's holiday light display is also included in the State of Ohio's holiday light trail this year. So this means that Gehanna's um, display is one of 55 that were chosen um, by the State of Ohio Division of Tourism. So they're promoting Gehanna as a destination um, for holiday light viewing and bringing um, more awareness to our city here. Um, the Ohio Herb Center and Visit Gehanna are hosting uh, Santa visits in person. Um, this is for the first time since 2019. Um, this will be on Saturday, and the families um, have already, as soon as the slots were available, the reservations um, pretty much filled up. So um, I believe that those are all filled now. So um, it is a free activity, but families are encouraged to bring donations for Grin. Um, and on a side note, I would uh, recommend that the donations for Grin not be green beans, maybe a different vegetable as I spent <laughs> most of my day organizing green beans today. <laughs> that is all for me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, school board, Ms. Powers. I have nothing to report tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Item J, official reports. Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Congratulations to the Historical Society for a wonderful event. Uh, first the Santa Run Saturday morning, and then uh, the Historical Society held a Victorian Christmas event on Saturday. Uh, they had all three buildings open. Um, Councilwoman McGregor and her family, her entire family, were there uh, organizing crafts and making crafts. And uh, 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 Kylie, who you just appointed to civil service, did a fantastic job organizing that as well uh, and of course having uh, Victorian Santa available as well. What a, what a wonderful opportunity for people to come into our community and to see that historical treasure that is really down there and is um, 
only kind of an unsung hero of our community. Um, Friday, we attended ED411, which was the first time that Jobs Ohio and the Mid-Ohio uh, Development Exchange returned to their in-person event, one Columbus, I should say. Uh, and our development director, uh, Nate Strum, was actually a moderator, so he, of course, was always entertaining. Uh, but there were about 600 people at the Ohio State Union for that event. Uh, fantastic conversations happening around placemaking, uh, strategies for developing a, a DEI workforce, etc. cetera. So um, I applaud the day and uh, the great opportunity for that conversation. Um, of course, congratulations to the football team uh, for the first time in 40 years being regional champions. Uh, did brave the Mansfield weather uh, and head up there a few weeks ago for that game. I still think they could have won that game uh, had they just scored that first touchdown, but uh, they had a phenomenal season and are much to be congratulated about their success. Uh, and I don't know how many of you know, but this past Friday, uh, it was the very first girls wrestling team tournament held at the high school. Uh, and uh, that's pretty special. So we got some great girl power happening over at the high school as well. Uh, would like to commend, again, re reference officer uh, Jeff Hoffman for his work um, in the OVI arrest category, uh, certainly as a devoted officer uh, and a stalwart leader within the division uh, for his work in that. Uh, this is a time when you're, everybody is on the road, we're traveling to vi visit family, whether it's impaired driving, distracted driving, um, whatever it is, uh, just one second can change families uh, for a lifetime. Uh, and we have an officer who's at home recovering um, from a, a situation where he was uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, of course, it was inclement weather, but still, everybody has to pay attention when they are on the roads. Uh, because we want everybody to be, to be safe. Um, I also want to share uh, just a situation that happened this evening uh, with police. Um, earlier this evening, I was advised that our officers uh, were planning for the arrest of a kidnapping and domestic violence suspect uh, in the Christopher Wren Apartments. Information was developed that the suspect may also uh, be in the company of an individual who was wanted in connection with a murder in the Detroit area. Uh, our officers uh, organized a SWAT operation, um, went over to execute the warrant. Once officers entered the apartment, uh, they did locate several firearms um, that were re really ready at hand for the occupants inside. I believe one was uh, situated just inside the window um, that could have been used against our officers as they were approaching. Um, the murder, mur murder suspect, excuse me, was taken into custody uh, and was indeed wanted for a violent killing that impacted the Detroit community. Suspects were taken into custody without incident or injury to anyone, uh, but they were armed and undoubtedly ready for a confrontation uh, with police. So we are just very thankful that, uh, once again, our division uh, worked as a team uh, with our partners um, and executed a situation that could have gone uh, very dangerously for every. It was a dangerous situation, but it could have gone uh, very negatively. But uh, with their professionalism and their training, they were managed able managed to uh, execute that uh, in an uneventful manner. So uh, applaud them as well for the evening, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. City Attorney. Thank you. Um, I used up all my words last meeting, so I think I'll be <laughs> quiet this time. <laughs> it's always a pleasure, Mr. Attorney. All right, item K, council comment. Ms. Angelou. Well, I just wish everybody the uh, rest of the week that it everything goes well for people. I'm not feeling very, very well right now. So um, of course, I'm going to put my <laughs> mask back on. Um, but I do hope that um, next time we can get all of our ED411 people there because it's so wonderful to have a beautiful uh, picture of all of us together. And it was really terrific today, this, this time. And I think uh, Nate Strom has a lot to do with that. So we are very fortunate to have him. So I, I know I enjoyed the day very much, and I thank the, the mayor for driving me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. McGregor. First of all, I'd like to apologize for jumping in. <laughs> when Ray was asked a question, I was just trying to save him looking up. Because you know, I, I kind of felt I knew what it was. So uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I just thank all the people who came out for the Victorian Christmas uh, with the Historical Society. It started off kind of rough. We got there, and I noticed there were mutton bars gone from the windows, and I knew immediately there's a squirrel in the log house. And so uh, my husband had to go in and chase the squirrel out. We had to open the doors and chase the squirrel out, put all the mutton bars back up, clean up the gnawings where he'd gnawed on the 
Um, it's, you know, old houses are just so much fun. And <laughs> so uh, that was our first visitor. And um, <laughs> they had, uh, we had a wonderful Santa, Jason Rourke and Colleen were there all day. And uh, people just really loved it. And Jason was so funny. He had his uh, Victorian robe, was really like a robe, a kind of a, a burgundy with a, a brown fur around it. But underneath he had his red Santa pants. And so he would say, the kids would kind of come in and look at him. He says, are you looking for Santa like this? And he'd pull up his his robe and there was the real the, the traditional Santa that we're used to and the kids would just laugh it was kind of funny so um, but we had some real interesting crafts they were not particularly easy and at one time it sounded like Santa's workshop with seven people with hammers and tin cans tapping a pattern out on the tin cans and Jim said it was just like Santa's workshop and there were all these but the parents were so patient with the kids and they really seemed to enjoy it I appreciate my granddaughters one of their friends. They are, two of them are seniors, and they needed volunteer hours, so they helped out. And um, it was really fun to have the kids, the younger people, helping out the, the little kids with the crafts. Um, I think that's all I had to say. We had crafts. We had the Santa. We had cookies and wassail in the uh, bed and breakfast. And so um, it was a great day. The weather was nice, and people were, were able to walk around. So hopefully next year we'll have even more fun things to do. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney. Uh, apparently, Councilwoman McGregor also thought I used up all my words last <laughs> meeting. <I'm thinking. laughs> all right. Mr. Weaver. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'll be brief this evening. I um, hope everyone had a nice Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, feels like that was ages ago now, but uh, mm -hmm. it's just last week. Um, Hope everyone had a nice holiday. Uh, congratulations to uh, Kylie Cooper Cyrus on her appointment to the Civil Service Commission. Um, as uh, Ms. Bowers indicated, it, it's those, the boards and commissions are a great way to get involved with the community. And speaking of ways to get involved with the community, uh, I did notice uh, that the city's uh, website has been updated with job postings for summer positions. Um, so I encourage folks to uh, apply and get involved. Um, and then I would just echo everyone's comments to please be safe out there on the roads. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Ms. Padova. Thank you. Um, congratulations to uh, Officer Hoffman on receiving the Core Value Award this evening. Um, and thank you to the Mayor and um, Chief Spence as well for addressing the parking issue on um, Jan Drive tonight. Um, I've talked to Ms. Bates about this a few times, and um, the situation has certainly escalated here since school started. So I'm glad to hear that we're making progress on this situation, and hopefully um, this will be a solution for um, those incidents. Um, on Saturday, I had the opportunity to attend the Pinnell Christmas Extravaganza that's um, held I, every year for I don't even know how many years now, um, but uh, by Pinnell Dance Center and the Gahanna Lions Club. Um, it is a great show, and together this year they were able to donate um, over 3,000 pounds of food to Grin to help support um, our community here. So um, I encourage everybody to get out and see that next year if you haven't been to it before. They do a great job, and it's everybody from the teeny tiniest dancers that they have there at the studio all the way up to the seniors who some of them go off and um, dance um, professionally, so they do an excellent job. Um, that's all from me. Thank you. 3,000 pounds of food. How much of that was the green beans that you talked green about? Beans. A lot of green beans. <laughs> <laughs> there are always a lot of green beans. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. All right, Mr. Snetzer. You know, nothing to add this evening, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bowers. I'll just, uh, very briefly, again, I just want to uh, recognize so many great people and organizations that have been contributing to a very festive holiday season already. Um, church groups, civic associations, the Historical Society, Grin, Visit Kahana, and so many others. Um, these holiday traditions are important because they do bring us together and also out in the community, which helps us to know each other and contributes to a sense of stewardship and fellowship. Um, Rathburn Woods Civic Association has been doing carriage rides in the neighborhood for 
about 25 years, I think. And um, we, the, it has continued to pass along to um, the next generation of homeowners. So it's really wonderful when we see these traditions continue um, and, and how it helps us get to know each other and spend time with each other uh, and really get to know our community. So I just want to thank everyone who's involved in any small or large way. Um, and a particular shout out, the Rourkes are, you guys are Mr. and Mrs. Christmas. So it's great to see you here tonight. Thank you. Um, I too want to actually say my congratulations to Officer Hoffman to actually winning the core award. It's always a, a great pleasure to actually see one of our officers, you know, get uh, decorated or award of any type and uh, because of the service that they do. Um, we also heard uh, from the public and I want to thank the public for actually having the courage to come forward and talk about um, a problem in one of our areas or uh, sectors of our city. Um, and I also appreciate uh, deeply the students actually coming as well um, and having uh, a balanced discussion about that. Um, one of the big things you're getting close to another core thing that I talk about is vigilantism. We can't do that. We must obey what the rules are. We must obey what the laws are. And so therefore, if we do see um, an issue, if we're confronted with an issue, we must remember that the police are the ones that are actually uh, ready to actually take action. Um, unfortunately, news travels fast of uh, one or two uh, bad students you know spoiling a lot we we do recognize that that's not the truth um and uh so thank you again for you know coming and helping you know provide that balance um this is a discussion that uh, we heard from the city that's actually going to start taking action um and then i really do move you to please talk to school board about this so I don't have any further uh, discussions. Uh, do I have a motion for adjournment? No, I think we have to go to executive, executive, session. executive session. Oh, I forgot about the executive session. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we do have an executive session. Um, real quick, uh, to go into executive session under authority section 5.40C of the Council Rules of Procedure to confer with Mr. City Attorney for the public body concerning disputes involving public body that are the subject of pending or imminent court action. I added the mister. Uh, do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. I have it first by Mr. Weaver. Second. Second by Mr. Snetzer. Any discussion? Right. Uh, Jeremy, please call the roll. Weaver? Yes. Schnetzer? Yes. Padova? Yes. Renner? Yes. Angelou? Yes. Bowers? Yes. McGregor? Yes. Thank you. We don't have any executive uh, or uh, legislative action coming out of this. So, uh, and then when we come back, we're going to be adjourning and going right into Finance Committee. So, good night.
You got the green light there, Jeremy? Okay. Getting the green light from the right side of the table here. Okay, let's commence Finance Committee for December 5th, 2022. Uh, we have two items on the agenda this evening. The first one is a quarterly financial report. Uh, anything from the mayor before I turn it over to Director of Finance? No, sir. Okay. Ms. Burry, you have the floor. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, so today we're going to discuss the quarter three results for the general fund, the special revenue funds that receive income taxes and the capital improvement fund. We're going to talk about income tax trends through the third quarter, uh, how our investments are looking, and then a conclusion based on the third quarter results. So if you're following along uh, in the report itself, this is located on page five of the report. Um, so this is the general fund, which is gonna be broken down um, into the various categories. So we're gonna start with revenue. Uh, so revenue through the third quarter is 83% of planned, which is slightly higher than would be expected. Um, the highlights to note about that are income tax coming in at 78% of planned, and we'll discuss that a little further on. And property taxes at 90%. Uh, which represents 100% of the collections for the year. Those are distributed to us two times a year in March and in August. So that represents full collections for the year. Uh, other revenue, or other taxes, sorry, which represents lodging tax is about 68% of planned. And compared to pre-pandemic levels, it's still 20% down, 27% down, but uh, is still seeing some improvement. Uh, investment income is coming in at 142%. So as the city's investments are maturing, uh, we're finding some higher yield investments uh, to take advantage of. And license and permits are 125% of plan just based on various construction projects throughout the city. As we look at other revenue, you'll see the large amount there, uh, same as first and second quarter. Uh, this is related to those reimbursements for the EV charging stations. Compared to 2021, we have a 9% increase of about 1.9 million, uh, driven by income taxes, which again, we'll discuss later, um, and also fines and fees increasing by 416,000. Uh, this is related to the movement of the general services division in public service back to the general fund. It was in the special revenue fund for 2021. Interest in investment income is 57% increase or 205,000. Um, again, as investments are maturing, we're, we're able to take care, advantage of that uh, high yield interest rate, the interest rate increases that have been coming in. License and permits are up 73%, um, as again, as construction projects continue throughout the city and other revenue, again, related to those EV charging stations is up um, about 249,000. Sorry, Joanne, there's a, the, the title of the file for some reason shows 2015. However, the document is accurate in there, so we're just getting that sorted out. That's what the chatter up here is about. You're fine. Uh, From your vantage point, you're fine. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, moving on to uh, expenditures. So compared to plan, we're at about 62%, but when outstanding encumbrances are taken into account, it's about 77%, uh, which is about where you'd want to be for the third quarter. Uh, compared to 2021, we have a 15% increase of 2.3 million. Uh, salaries and benefits are driving 1.2 million of that at, at an 11% increase. Uh, same as we've discussed previously, uh, we have the 2021 salary study that came into play uh, for 2022, including um, the changes that were made for the new compensation program. Um, for those who weren't impacted by either of those, there were cost of living increases. Uh, we have the two union contracts, FOP and FOP OLC. So in the second quarter was when their retro pay was made for those contracts um, that will continue then through the rest of the year. Um, again, the movement of the public service, general services division, and a portion of parks and recreation back to the general fund are also driving some of those costs. Then we also had some new positions, uh, vacant positions that were outstanding from 2021 that were filled. Materials and, and supplies and contract services will kind of address at the same time. So majority of this is that movement back of the general services division of the public service. Um, but then we also have some inflationary cost increases. 
A lot of this is impacting uh, our fleet as far as materials and supplies. And on the contract services side, we also had some uh, one-time initiatives um, that are coming into play for 2022, the capital improvement plan, and then the Creekside uh, garage and plaza kind of master plan. So what impact is this having on fund balance? Um, revenues are in excess of expenditures by approximately 4.3 million. Uh, we have some transfers out and advances. Uh, transfers out, you'll see a decrease there. That was planned. Uh, we have less that we had to transfer over to the debt service fund. And the advance in is related to that repayment from the water fund. If you all remember back in, I think it was 2016, we had to advance some funds over for a meter reading error. So this is the water fund paying us back. So in total, we have a net impact to fund balance of a little over $4 million. Looking at fund balance in total, that brings us to $28.3 million as of the end of September. We have a little over $4 million reserved for encumbrance. The emergency reserve is intact at $6.7 million, which leaves us an unreserved, unassigned fund balance of about $17.5 million, which represents about nine months of operations. Any questions on the general fund before I move on? Briefly, the, uh, the fund balance, is that expected to hold, or do you see any large expenditures in Q4 that would draw that down? I'm expecting that to hold. Okay, thank you. Uh, revenue seems to be tracking in the same manner it has, and there's no, nothing that's come to light sure. um, going through the third quarter that's gonna cause expenditures to spike at all. And then what was the percentage, I think you had said salaries and benefits, was it 11%? Increase from last year? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just add that um, for those that don't know, in my day job, I work in public finance, and so dealing with municipalities all across the country, states, uh, local governments, in some cases higher ed institutions, and uh, I just read an outlook by one of the ratings agencies today for states that talked about um, that was the number one cost pressure uh, that they're anticipating for 2023 was, was salaries and benefits. So it isn't to suggest that everybody within the city got an 11% raise. We're also adding additional staffing and those types of things. But in a highly competitive labor market, um, with inflation being what it is, you know, cost of living adjustments are going up. And um, so it's not unique to just the city of Gahanna. I just want to provide a bit of context that quite literally every um, unit of government in the country is dealing with this from K through 12 on down to cities and park districts, et cetera, et cetera. So we're all kind of facing the same cost pressures. Absolutely. Anything from council uh, to this point? No. All right, Joanne, please continue. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the public safety fund um, and the remainder of the special revenue funds and the capital improvement. Um, these are located on pages 6 uh, through 10, I believe, of the report itself. So looking at the public safety fund, uh, we have revenues of about $1.1 million, which is 85% of planned, a large portion of that related to income tax. Um, and then we also have the charters for services that are up. A uh, portion of this is related to the SRO, or the School Resource Officers Program. Um, as their wages increase, uh, so do the charges that are associated with providing that service. We have expenditures of 312000 uh, which are 56% of plan, a little bit lower, um, but as we had discussed in the first two quarters, uh, with the community liaison officer, um, wasn't filled until March, and then a vacant school resource officer wasn't filled until February, so we see some salary savings there. Looking at 2021, you see a slight increase for salaries and benefits, and that is related to the addition of that community liaison officer in 2022. Uh, as we end the third quarter, uh, we have fund balance of about 879000 which is an increase of about 273000 um, and of that amount, about 3,800 is reserved for encumbrance. Moving on to the Parks and Recreation Fund, uh, we got about 1.7 million in revenue, which is 103% of plan, uh, which is expected because it, this is the end of their season. Their season kind of wraps up in Q3, so we would expect the majority of their revenue to already be recognized at this point. 
Uh, we also have more than expected in income tax. Again, we'll address that um, in a few minutes here. Uh, looking at their expenditures, it's 1.3 million or 72% of planned, um, about where you'd expect to be um, for the end of their season and running off the, the rest of the year. Uh, there is a 3% increase in expenditures compared to 2021, and um, that is just the increase in salaries and benefits, which is mainly driving that. We ended the third quarter for Parks and Recreation Fund with 1.4 million, which is a 381,000 increase, and about 318,000 of that is reserved for encumbrance. Moving on to the public service fund, uh, we have revenues of 1.1 million, which is 91% of plan, uh, a little bit higher than you would expect for the third quarter. Uh, compared to 2021, revenue is down uh, 31%. Again, talking about that movement of activity back to the general fund, so you'll see the decreases mainly within that fines and fees. Uh, there's also a little bit of a decrease in income tax, and that was a change in allocation as we moved into the 2022 year. On the expenditure side, we have 734,000, which is 47% of plan, um, much lower than would be expected. Uh, as you may recall, this fund basically accounts for the engineering uh, department. Um, as you all may know, they have had many vacancies throughout the year, which is driving that, that slow amount compared to the budget or reduced amount compared to the budget, uh, still a number of vacancies. With that, you have your contract services, materials, and supplies. Most of those are related to associated projects that you need those staff to conduct. So they're kind of working hand in hand. You have vacancies, you can't get to your projects. Looking at the public service fund balance, we're ending at about 1.4 million, an increase of about 330,000. And of this amount, 354,000 is reserved for encumbrance. We want to pause there and see if council has any questions or comments on the special revenue funds. Yep. Is there a number that shows how much was returned um, for the pool passes that were, um, once they changed the rules, they offered a refund to some of the um, members that, you know, couldn't take advantage of it because of the change in the rules? I'd have to speak to Stephanie about that. Okay. Uh, so they have a, a separate reporting system for the charges for services that they bring in, which is rec track. Um, so they would have to run a report from there um, to show what the, those changes might be. So I'll make sure I pass that question on to Stephanie. Um, or if you could email me, because I'm probably not going to remember every single thing that you just said. Okay. Uh, so, can, uh, or you could just email her. Stephanie sure. directly. And, and she could respond to I that. I just saw there was a negative like over under revenues. And I just know if that was part of it or for parks. Uh, in the parks and rec? Yeah, is that parks? No, that's public service. Maybe yeah, I was going to say, they're actually, uh, their okay. charges for services are actually up um, about 94000 uh, compared to last year. This No, this was on parks. It was said over under reviews, revenues. Oh, so uh, their revenues exceeding expenditures by the oh, three, 361000 okay. Gotcha. Anything further from council on the uh, special revenue funds? No. Joanne, just a quick question. So while it perhaps is not the largest you know, absolute dollar amount, the fines and fees in the public service fund on a percentage basis seems to really outstrip the budgeted amounts. Just curious what might be the driver for that. Um, so I'd have to look to Tom on that one, um, but I believe there are specific uh, fees that are collected related to inspections for various projects um, and since projects are up uh, these are also so up like and development I, projects uh, it's not only that and I'll, I'll let Tom speak to the okay. fees that he collects Fair enough. <laughs> just make sure this is on yep, um, so development projects are up so we capture cost associated with inspections okay. uh, for private development and as a part of the sidewalk program, uh, a lot of residents have taken it on their own initiative to uh, have sidewalk installed in lieu of going through the assessment process. So there's inspections associated with 
um, with that uh, right of way um, permit that's pulled. So we're seeing increases there as well. Okay, thank you. Anything further from council before I assume we move on to capital improvement fund? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all right, Joanne, back to you. Uh, so looking at the capital improvement fund, uh, have 7.6 million in revenue through the th third quarter, about 84% of plan higher, mainly driven by income tax. Um, on the expenditure side, uh, we're at 4.8 million or 18% of plan. Uh, with encumbrances, that's about 89% of plan. Um, and compared to 2021, we're up about 1.8 million or 59% as older uh, previous projects are kind of completion and we're making headway on some of the 2022 uh, projects that are coming up. Uh, that increase we're seeing from, from year to year is based on the activity happening within those projects. Uh, fund balance ended at 20.6 million, which is an increase of about 2.9 million. Um, and of that amount, 18.4 is reserved for encumbrance. Um, following the capital improvement statement in your packet is a list of projects for 2022 and kind of what their status is. We won't go over those today, but it is in your actual report itself. Any questions on capital improvements before I move on? Anything from council? So Joanne, the, in essence, in a nutshell, with the capital improvement fund, um, there's projects that essentially are in process or committed to, however you want to you know, casually phrase that, but we just haven't essentially written the check yet. Is that how it works? Correct. Okay, so that's the encumbrance portion there. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to kind of touch on income tax. I'm going to go over a couple things. Uh, this one I felt was important uh, for everybody to see so we could see where some of the increases and decreases are coming. Um, but in total, there was $25.7 million in income tax collected through the third quarter. That makes up 70% of general fund revenue, 99% uh, of the capital improvement fund, and about 65% of the special revenue funds. Uh, looking at the makeup of those income tax collections, 77% uh, is related to withholdings, with 11% coming from individual returns and 12% coming from net profits. So looking at those three buckets, withholding, individual, and net profit taxes, kind of looking at how each of those have functioned through the third quarter. So we are seeing withholding uh, coming in relatively high, and we're seeing net profits dropping uh, by a pretty significant amount. So this is kind of what we predicted at the end of 2021. We kind of knew that that net profit piece was probably an anomaly, and we kind of see it stabilize. We're kind of seeing that play out in 2022, that net profit tax kind of returning back to normal levels. Um, we also felt that we were in enough of an economic expansion that withholding taxes, uh, the increases there would probably um, outshadow any decreases that we would see in net profit taxes. So that's kind of what we're seeing still playing out uh, through the third quarter, um, anticipating similar results um, as we wrap up the year. So probably looking at about a 4% uh, increase uh, for the general fund or the 1.5% and then um, about a 5% increase for each of the other funds that receive that 1%. Anything from council on that particular topic? So low unemployment and wages going up. Great for us. <laughs> yeah, good for the city. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Joanne. You're welcome. Now kind of moving on to investments. Uh, this is the makeup of our investment portfolio. We have about 2% net cash, which is basically our banking accounts uh, that we operate out of. And 98% is invested in some, some way. 65% um, in government bonds, CDs, commercial paper, 32% in Star Ohio, and then a very small portion that's sitting in a money market. That's as investments mature. They go into the money market until they could be reinvested. So that means that the majority of our funds are, are pretty well invested at this point. Uh, looking at the duration, we have about 1.48 years on average for investment portfolio, and the yield is about 2.05%. Um, compared to Star Ohio, it was 254 and then kind of looking at that two-year treasury curve. Now, since we're at a 1.48 uh, 
uh, year duration, we kind of use that as a, as a key to see where are we kind of heading. Um, so kind of interesting, September of 2021, we were at 0.28%. Um, we're now at 4.22%, uh, which is exceeding pre-pandemic levels from 2019, which came in at 1.63%. So seeing those interest rate hikes by the feds kind of playing out on our investment side. As we kind of talked earlier, we are seeing that kind of happen now with our investment portfolio, experiencing a 57% increase over 2021. Um, and again, we're well over 100% of what we had planned um, before we knew these interest rate hikes were gonna kind of come in. So as we continue through 2022 and into 2023, the main goal of our investment advisors are gonna be to look at our portfolio in the same strategic manner that they have, making sure they're securing our investments, security is always key, and trying to take advantage of those rising interest rates. Um, and through the third quarter, uh, just kind of glancing through our yields for all of our investments, we've been able to reinvest um, so up to 4.5% um, for some investments through the third quarter. So moving on to the uh, conclusion here, uh, as we end the third quarter, we're seeing that revenue stabilization occur. We're seeing actual results exceeding expectations on the revenue side. We're seeing expenditures a little bit lower um, than expected. Some of that is driven uh, by salaries and benefits as we've you know, lost some individuals and, and we're searching for and re trying to recruit and retain that human capital. Um, looking at the economy as a whole, uh, still seeing that recovery, right? Low unemployment rate, growth in GDP for the first time in 2022 occurred in the third quarter. Um, although some believe that's gonna be short-lived. Uh, inflation continues to re remain high, but those interest rate hikes are starting to bring it down just a tad. Um, so it is working. Uh, they're still expecting though uh, some additional rate hikes through the end of the year to try to keep that moving in the right direction. Um, some of this is also causing a shift in consumer demand. So with that, a lot still believe that there is the potential for a recession in the near future, um, but based on the economic growth that we're currently experiencing and kind of seeing how the economy is moving, we don't think that that's going to slow the economic expansion that Kahana is currently in um, or stop it. It may bring things down a little bit, but it, we'll just have to see kind of how 2023 plays out, but we really think that that economic expansion is gonna continue into the out years for the city. And that concludes my Q3 report. Any questions, comments? Yeah, Mr. Weaver. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Director, so much. And I apologize for my technical difficulties at the beginning. <laughs> no problem. Um, materials and supplies, um, are you seeing any Trends of that stabilizing, I, you know, I think NPR was reporting that we're starting to see some things mellow for lack of, for my non-economic words. Yeah. Um, so through the third quarter, didn't see much of a change. Um, those prices still seem to be remaining relatively high uh, compared to past years. Uh, but we're hoping that as we move into the first quarter of 2023, that maybe things start to slow a little bit and we could actually start seeing some of those pricing come down. Um, the other side of that is utility costs is kind of driving that too. Uh, once gas prices go up, the fuel surcharge then reappears on everything. Um, so we not only just have overall inflation on the materials themselves, but also when gas prices go up, there's additional fees that are tacked on that are also driving some of that cost. Thank you. Ms. Bowers. Thank you. The, uh, going back to the business profits, I know you were quoted in an article a few weeks ago. Um, just so I understand, are, um, are, you are you saying that they're stabilizing or that they're returning to, are they stabilizing in terms of not continuing that upward trajectory or are they receding back to pre-2020 levels? They're receding back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, I can't, I, I didn't do an analysis yet to that, um, but I'll make sure that I include that in my Q4 report to show kind of where we are compared to um, pre-pandemic. My guess is that they're still up a little bit mm -hmm. compared to pre-pandemic, um, but this is just that 2020 anomaly kind of 
coming off. Um, so I could see as we move forward that they'll be more similar to what we're seeing here um, through the third quarter um, and throughout the year, uh, probably more around the $1.8, $2 million, a little bit more than $2 million mark. Um, but I'll make sure that I address that in Q4 and see how that is comparing to, it's easier to compare year to year. Yeah. So I'll see where that total lies okay. compared to previous pre-pandemic years. That sounds great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So on that topic, Joanne, do you have a, and if you mentioned this in a prior report, forgive me, it would be, a, it would be alluding me to right at the moment. Do you know what the driver of that spike was in 2021? Was that stimulus related? Was that, you know, some sort of- I think it was multiple factors. Okay. Um, so one, when uh, they sent everybody home, mm -hmm. uh, operating costs for those facilities that they were maintaining for their employees to work in came down. If you don't have people in there, they're not using the resources. Uh, the other part of that was there were certain industries that actually gained quite a bit during the pandemic. Uh, you think about those who supply... Um, uh, right. Uh, PPE personal protective equipment and sanitizing uh, materials. So, and technology too. Um, when they sent everybody home to work, a lot were not prepared for that. So trying to find the technology to allow those employees to work from home also created spikes on the uh, information technology side of the house also. Um, then you have the flip side of that where some just decided to completely get rid of their brick and mortar. So now they have a huge overhead cost that's gone, which drove up their net profits, which in turn uh, drove up the income taxes that were gonna be collected. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Uh, anything further from council with regard to the Q3 update? All right. Thank you, Director Burry. Uh, we have uh, another item on the agenda here for Finance Committee, um, and is of course the fiscal year 2023 budget. Um, very briefly, just some housekeeping notes for anybody that <clears throat> may be tuning in for the first time is not familiar with our process. Um, between the prior, or I'm sorry, between the last uh, finance committee meeting and today, um, council submits questions, batches them, and uh, provides them to the administration for, uh, I guess, what we'll call homework so that we can come back with a prepared response. Uh, I have a list of those questions. There were a few that were... Um, I guess we'll call them butter beaters, buzzer beaters. Uh, did not make the list, but I have them here and they've been forwarded to the administration. I assume um, the administration is prepared to address those. If not, we'll kind of take them on the fly. And then um, we've got a couple of items for council discussion as well that I have jotted down here on, on the, the sheet. Um, so with that, I'll dive right into question one, if that's okay with the administration, if you guys are prepared. Okay, just read it from the list. Um, Question one, under general government, the proposed budget request includes a planned use of unrestricted, unreserved general fund balance in fiscal year 2023. The ask is to be uh, prepared to discuss and or project how the requests implemented in 2023, such as staffing additions, contractually mandated labor cost increases, benefits, et cetera, will flow through to fiscal years 2024 through 2027, particularly in regard to future uses of general fund balance. And uh, I believe this item can be referenced on page 38 in the budget book that we've been provided. Uh, so before we kind of uh, discuss the impact on fund balance, I kind of wanted to go back to the budget presentation and look at what the impact to general fund balance has been uh, over the years, just to kind of kind of set where we've kind of been. Um, so 2017 to 2021, uh, this slide was in the uh, budget uh, request pe presentation. Um, so showing that before issue 12, so through 2019, uh, we had used general fund resources for capital since we didn't have a dedicated capital resource. Um, so looking at uh, 17 through 19, kind of using those funds. Um, but at the end of the day, we still, in most cases, used less than what we were planning. Uh, in addition, 2019 looks a little strange. Again, that was that income tax lawsuit settlement year. So in this case, we had planned on returning funds, but ended up using them for that settlement. So after issue 12, uh, using the general fund for what it is intended for, for operations. Um, 
So there were a couple things like the pandemic that we're kind of playing in, um, but basically for 2020 and 2021, uh, we had planned on returning a little over 1 million for 2020 and actually returned 3.1 million. And then for 2021, uh, we had planned on using 1.5 million and actually returned a little over 4 million. Um, so returning about 7.1 million uh, over those two years, uh, bringing us back to an excess of where we were um, at the end of 2017. So kind of just level setting um, and then talking about why this would happen. Um, so the appropriations are our plan for the year. It's our best guess based on current circumstances. What council authorizes is kind of that cap, right? These are the plans and initiatives that we have planned for the year. You're authorizing up to this amount for us to spend for that. Um, so in most years we spend less as this is, is reflecting and then sometimes revenue comes in high. But just looking at the expense side, some things just come about that are unforeseen or outside of our control. Some are inside of our control. So if we have employee turnover, for example, um, can't find a qualified contractor, unforeseen delays, weather, illness, uh, vendor backlog, supply chain disruptions, uh, sometimes uh, initiatives that we want to take on, once we get into it, we realize that maybe there's a better way that's more beneficial. Uh, or we get through a process and we think that maybe it's only going to take two to three months as we start to peel back those layers for that process. It actually is a longer time frame to get it accomplished. So just looking at what happens between plan and when we bring it to you for authorization as to what we're allowed to spend the dollars for and up to what limit and then what occurs during the year that kind of drives these changes. So the next two slides are gonna address the first question um, that was read. So this was talking about what is the impact on salaries and benefit, of salaries and benefits on the budget? So the first line that you see there is estimated revenue. This is purely revenue. No unreserved fund balances included in here. It's what we're expecting from 2023 to 2027 to occur with revenue alone and what our estimated salaries and benefits number is. So looking from 2023 to 2027, revenue covers the full amount expected and in addition leaves about 9.8 to 8.5 million available for contract services and materials and supplies. So again, kind of thinking about the budget as a whole, it's very difficult to pinpoint what exactly is driving the use of fund balance. For 2023, I would argue that it's probably contract services and materials and supplies. We have the inflationary um, increases that we're seeing within the budget for those two items, as well as some one-time initiatives that we're seeing for contract services. So in my mind, as far as what is actually driving that delta or use of fund balance for 2023, I would more than likely point to contract services and materials and supplies. Joanne, can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. What's the implied revenue growth rate there from 23 to 27? That the estimated revenue? Yeah, so it goes from 29.7 to 30 point, let's call it five. Yep, so that's that's that, total that uh, like revenue, so it would be mainly driven by income tax, of course, as our largest one, but. I'm sorry, I, what's the implied growth rate, say from 23 to 24? I can see oh. the, the estimated increase in salaries and benefits, but what's the estimated increase in revenue there? Um, I don't have that calculated right now. Okay. Um, but I could lay that in before I send the. It's, it's fine. I think, it, I think it's equivalent to probably about uh, three, four percent maybe. Okay. I know in years past it's been like two to three. I didn't know if you just plugged in three percent and just carried it out. No, so this is, this is looking at each revenue source individually. So when we do the projection, we look at income tax, um, provide a projection there, and then we go through each type of revenue and determine what increases or decreases uh, we might be expecting based on what drives those particular revenues. Okay. Um, in most cases, the largest driver is going to be income tax, but we do look at each of those categories separately and individually and determine what we could expect moving forward. So according to the iPhone calculator from 23 to 24, it's two and a half percent. So, yeah, I mean, right. that's in the ballpark of where you've been historically. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. 
Uh, so then kind of looking at salaries and benefits from a historical perspective of what's been requested and what's actually been spent. Uh, so in 2019, uh, we spent uh, 977 less um, than what was planned, or 94% of the budget was used. Moving through to the third quarter of 2023, um, looking at similar results. Uh, for 2023, I did use just 75% of the 2023 budget since this is Q3 numbers. Um, so rationally, you would expect by the end of the qu third quarter that you would use about 75%. So that's taking salaries and benefits by 75%. So if we project that forward, and if we're expecting similar salary savings compared to the budget for 2023, we really wouldn't use fund balance. Um, it's just when we set those budgets at the beginning of the year, it's our best plan. Who we're expecting to bring in, when we're expecting to bring them in, and there are a number of reasons why we might come in under budget. So we have unexpected employee separations, those that we weren't maybe expecting to leave, leave. Uh, we have an inability to recruit for a position, just can't find the right candidate. On the flip side of that, we may have a great recruitment, one that causes us to go back and look at our plan and say, well, if we have this person and we could bring them in and they have this level of skill, do we really need these other individuals that we might have planned? So there's a lot of analysis that kind of goes on during the year, same as the overall budget. Um, where can we bring somebody in? Maybe we have the inability, maybe we bring somebody in a little bit better. We also have change in operations. If we're able to find efficiencies along the way, we may decide that maybe we don't need that extra person. Or we might change operations to where maybe we do need additional people. So as the year progresses, we kind of continue to analyze our plan and determine where it can be tweaked or needs fixed. We also have qualifying events for employees. We're assuming that every employee is gonna keep the current level of coverage at the time that I prepare the budget. We all know that things happen during the year. Somebody may need to go from family to single, single to family. We may have those new employees that come on that choose a different level of coverage than the person that they're taking over. So again, some of those items that happen during planning and then as we get into the year, um, that may cause some of these salary savings. Yeah, so the qualifying events would be for health insurance. So again, some of these are in the control of the city, some are not, um, but the combination of all these things that occur, that occur throughout a year have historically resulted in the salary savings that we're seeing up here. So that's kind of how we're kind of seeing that salaries and benefits kind of playing out. We see that we have enough resources to cover the full amount that we're requesting through 2027 leaving that amount for salaries and uh, for materials and supplies and contract services. And then knowing that during the year, we also tend historically to have some of those salary savings where we're not quite using what we've anticipated. Thank you, Joanne, very thorough. Uh, anything from council regarding, I guess what we'll call a five-year outlook? No? Yeah, Ms. Bowers. Just does this, does the five-year projection or the, the four-year project projection that we've been looking at, is that all taking into consideration potential reclassifications or salary increases? I'm assuming the natural pay, pay grade increases that we've already approved would have been factored in, but, but what about beyond that? So when we move beyond the year that we're currently budgeting for, we tend to note that, okay, this is our plan. Realistically, this is a plan that we know we're probably going to keep for the next five years. So those items that happen as far as transition during the year are, are individuals that we might want to reclassify. When we prepare the next year's budget and we reanalyze staffing, we kind of take that same approach. So this is a staffing that we're requesting that we're anticipating on maintaining for the next four or five years. So then those are then projected out for the next four or five year period. I think uh, what you asked maybe is do those out your numbers include like additional staffing that like first sta five-year staffing plan no they do not okay. anything further on the um, five-year forward outlook hearing none okay so uh, again just taking the questions in order um, 
And Joanne, honestly, as I read this very briefly, it sounds like you might have touched on this a little bit already, um, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, I'll read it for the record. So question two is, are there any mitigating factors not spelled out in the budget that would reduce the actual use of fund balance compared to the projected planned use outlined in the budget request? In addition, if asked to narrow the gap between 2023 projected general fund revenues and expenditures, are there any items the administration would propose to defer to limit the use of fund balance? And again, for reference, this is on page 38 within our budget book. So again, given that you've already addressed some of that, I don't know if you mm -hmm. want to repeat any of it, but. Uh, yeah, so um, I prepared a couple slides to just show that same five-year outlook um, that we saw on that page incorporating everything. Um, and just kind of showing that graph on that page. This, this is the numbers behind it. Um, Again, as we had talked about, you know, as we project forward uh, into those years, we're, we're making a number of assumptions that are gonna vary from actual results. We're assuming no salary savings uh, related to attrition or insurance savings, and that we're gonna fund everything 100% even into the out years. Um, that we're gonna have continued growth in contract services, materials, and supplies based on what we know today. So those inflationary hikes continuing on into those future years when we know they're gonna be brought down probably a little bit. It also assumes that everything that we plan to do for a year, we're gonna complete. Uh, so a lot of times when we get into the year, again, we might have to change course due to employee turnover, other circumstances that may come about. So the main takeaway that I wanted from here um, and that you've seen in your budget book is we're still in compliance through 2027 with the general fund, fund balance policy. And we've actually increased our emergency reserve. So as the operational expenses are anticipated to increase, so does the emergency reserve. Sure. So we've increased it from 6.7 million to 7.45 million. So we've added $750,000 to the emergency reserve. And with that, we're still showing through 2027 that we're at least twice on reserve fund balance. Um, two months is required by the fund balance policy. So showing that we're still maintaining fund balance within that fund balance policy, keeping the emergency reserve intact, and in fact growing it from 2022 to 2023. I also want to show kind of what a 1% fluctuation in each of those could mean. First on a positive side, uh, which is probably where we're heading. Like I said, we tend to bring in more revenue than planned, and we tend to spend less than planned. So just kind of getting an idea of what would 1% mean for that. So here, where we would receive 1% more and spend 1% less, um, if you look back to the other slide, you kind of see what that change would mean. So it mean that we're actually adding back to fund balance for each of the years until we get to year four and five. And even though there would be an assumption that we would potentially use fund balance in year four and five, we're still well within our general fund policy having three times more in unreserved fund balance than the, the policy requires um, until we get to year five, which would be five months worth, but still more than two months required. So on the flip side of that, uh, if something were to occur and for some reason we had more of a negative impact on the budget. So in this scenario, it would be 1% less in revenue, but 1% more spent. Um, so showing that yes, we would use more fund balance in these scenarios, but we're still, even through the fifth year, still more than the two months required by the fund balance policy. So even if we have a chance where maybe we're not following those historical trends and maybe there's a negative impact, we're still within our fund balance policy through year five. And, and, yeah, Ms. Bowers. And I truly am just making sure I understand this correctly. None of these projections include any additional positions being added to the city. So no additional police officers, no additional parks and rec staff, even as the regional population grows. Correct. Each okay. budget year, we would look at that. And again, as we determine that for that budget year, we would then project that forward because really until we get into the year and we could look at our resources and we could look at what our actual need is, yes, we try to project that forward for five years to determine what our staffing needs may be. But just looking at what could happen in one year to try to determine what year two, three, four, and five with all the variables that may be there. So yes, this is assuming that we keep 2023 staffing throughout that five year period. 
Right, and, and to reiterate, that assumes that we are 100 percent full 365 days a year, which is not realistic. That will that will not happen. Any follow up on that? Okay. All right. Um, so for the second part of the question, uh, which kind of talks about the deferrals, uh, so based on the previous slides, we could see that estimated uh, revenues and resources fully fund salaries and benefits. We make those various assumptions as we discuss when we prepare the budget. We all know that actual results will vary based on the first slide that we showed. Uh, we do show that even if we do have a negative impact, we're still well within the fund balance policy. Um, so based on this, we really don't recommend that there's any items to be deferred. We don't want to fall back into old habits. This is kind of where we ended up where we are, right? Deferring, kicking the can. Um, so we, we really recommend that we don't fall back into those old habits and continue to move forward with these initiatives and priorities that we have. We could, however, look at the other side, the revenue. I've been ultra conservative on the revenue estimates. So we can look and see, is, is there wiggle room to maybe increase those revenue est estimates by a little bit? Um, if it is still the will of council that we look at items to defer, we kind of have some major priorities that are kind of driving a lot of these costs. So before we could decide what is it that we would reduce, we'd kind of need direction from council to tell us which one of these programs or priorities do we maybe not want to move forward on or defer to, to the next year. Um, so not looking for a response today, obviously, um, but as you, the slide deck is shared and you look at this, um, if there is a will of council that we do look at something to defer, we would need direction as to which one of these priorities that you would like us to, to maybe slow or defer on. So real quick, the implied assumption is the staffing request is being driven by What's, what's shown up on the screen, or perhaps even other items that are not shown on the screen, existing programs, sidewalk program with engineering, et cetera, et cetera, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Anything from council on uh, question two? You know, I, can I, if yeah. I could, I mean, we're getting late enough in this budget process that I think it's fair that you get some actual feedback from us versus just questions. So, you know, I, I think that this is, act, we're actually starting to get to the meat of the question at this point which is, you know, how are, these, uh, how are these positions and how is this restructuring going to drive the deliver these deliverables, right? Because I don't, I, there's nothing on there that I want to see deferred, but I want to know that is this restructuring, is, is this, are these additional positions going to deliver these, the, these items, right? And so that's, I think that's for me the meat of it. Um, I have concerns certainly about um, the the restructure, but I but I also ha see the positives to it too, and I want to be fair that I think that I, I do see that there's some um, sort of decentralization and and maybe better management that can happen through this this structure that's being proposed, um, but I do have concerns that you know as, as I think the region is going to grow as the city is going to grow. Um, are, we, are we making sure that we are continuing to fund out economic development fully? Um, are we making sure that we've got resources set aside to make sure that we can add a couple officers or SROs as we need to? So I think that's where I'm at with this. Um, so that's, that's really what I want to hear from the administration is how, do the, how does the new structure deliver what's on the screen? start and then Kevin the mayor Joanne chief feel free to add in <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things that I think is a little difficult to understand is like uh, Joanne and I well, Kevin right now work on the administrative side of the city um, so you just asked about adding more like making sure economic developments fully staff which we're working on additional officers I heard you mention like you know there's a, a national parks and rec found um, if you have this many park land, you should have this many people to maintain your park system. And so I think what's difficult to understand sometimes is what do we do on the administrative side of the city that supports those external operations? Because we're not out mowing grass, we're not out helping with parking issues, we're not out doing those things. And so this, this budget cycle, 
um, really focuses on adding to the administrative staff of the city to ensure that those officers can go out and do their job, so can the parks people, and so on. And so I think that's some of, some of the um, positions I think are, they're just a little more abstract because you don't know what like an asset administrator is gonna do on a daily basis. So for like one example, so when you're looking at the risk and safety program, um, so one of the requests is to add a risk and safety administrator to the city. Um, so that person will ensure that the safety program um, is evaluated and reviewed and then implemented properly. And what that will do is ensure successful operational programs, such as the street program, such as uh, when Parks takes out a chainsaw to make sure that they're wearing all the proper PPE that they need. And it's not just making sure that they do it, it's then going and do those spot checks to ensure that our risk compliance remains low so that the city doesn't find itself in some kind of financial situation because a horrific accident occurs. Um, so that's one example of something like that specific, pers that specific position, that's what they will be tasked with doing. Because um, on the administrative side, and I think Joanne could talk maybe a little bit about this, she's been doing this budget process solo since I got to the city four years ago. She puts in a ridiculous amount of hours this time of the year. Um, and so, you know, for the past few years, we've added police officers every single year I've been here for the last four years. We've added to the operational side. And besides adding a couple HR people, we have not added any IT staff or any finance staff. And so what you see are you see people working extra amount of hours, um, doing things because they're just, it, you know, to at some point we need to have officers on the street because that's a public safety concern. So now that we're in a spot where our operations are stable and working on some of that deferred maintenance, it's time to work on the deferred maintenance on the administrative side. And so, for instance, there's a finance analyst added to the budget to help with the procurement policy. We just we just rolled out, you guys all passed a, a, a big procurement policy. Well, it's great to have a policy, but if there's no one to enforce that policy and ensure it's being followed, it's just another policy. So it's important to add to the internal parts in that. Um, like. Uh, Chief and Kevin might be better to talk about this, but the CAD administrator. The Chief's gonna roll out a new CAD system next year for the police department and others. And without an IT person who knows, to, one, to help with that implementation, ensure it goes smoothly, and then carry out those missions of that CAD program and the rest of the big technology projects that the police department has, you can start seeing like, for example, last I heard, the Chief still maintains some access and user access to some of the systems. It certainly is not one of the best tasks of the good use of the chief's time. Um, and so they can probably speak more on that and I'll let Kevin talk about the asset administrator and what that means with our new asset management program. Yeah, there's been a long time where IT staff would ask chief, all right, we just bought a new police car, we just had a new police officer come on board, who's gonna enter that person into IMC, which is that CAD package that Miranda was just talking about. And chief would oftentimes say, well, it's just easier for me to do it, so I'll just do it. Um, yes, the chief of police. Uh, not appropriate, but that is the way in which we are, we are structured uh, to some degree. And structured is a, is a very loose term in that, in, in that regard. Um, to go back to your question, Ms. Bowers, I think, I think for me what a lot of this breaks down is to, is, is to the word quality. And, you know, I've only been sitting in this particular chamber now or this particular city for a couple of years, but the quality of work that this group and the administration and you folks all produce on behalf of the city is top notch. Um, <clears throat> I think that when we look back at different programs and different conversations that we've had, things that we've started, uh, I think last week the sidewalk program came up as the example, right? That just doesn't that just doesn't pop up and happen over a period of you know a, a short couple of months, right? I think uh, Ms. Maybe it was Mr. Snetzer who, who brought up the fact that you know that program or st those conversations started happening back in 2017. You know, and it takes it takes a group of people with determination uh, determination to make sure that these things are going to progress forward in a manner that is. Uh, suitable for a city of our size and meet the expectations of not just you folks, the seven of you plus the mayor, but also the 35,000, 36,000 folks that we serve on, on a daily basis. So for me, it, it, it really breaks down to quality. 
I think when you look at the organizational structure that we put in front of you in order to, to do this, uh, Mr. Weibensinger said a couple weeks ago that you know we've looked at those 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 top uh, tiered municipalities, not just in the region but across the country, and you see a structure very 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 similar to what it is that we put in front of you guys, in order really to take us from I guess what I'm going to say is a a sleepy hollow village type feel to a city that the, to a city that really wants to progress and meet the challenges that and Intel is going to put before this, before this particular community. Um, you know, that's, that goes to parts and pieces like Miranda was talking about, where we talk about uh, CAD administrators or, or, or asset administrators so that we can really get a handle on what are the operate, a system like asset uh, management really should drive the operational awareness that this city has available to it. We couldn't tell you, we can't tell you a lot of things about our infrastructure up until that program started happening. And again, when the time is right, we'll unveil that before you guys. But you know, it's at its infancy stage. I told uh, the mayor that we're more maybe in a soft launch type state right now. You know, and that's the type of quality that I think the reorg puts in front of you, uh, puts gives us the ability to provide to you guys. And then I also think some of those other operational type positions also give us the ability to also execute when you look at things up there like like DEI and a risk and safety program. So I'll, I'll add, a Chief, did you have something you want to talk about? Go ahead. I'll defer. Uh, so I think uh, as we look through uh, and, and work through the budget process and looked at the city structure and, and some of the programs that we're we're trying to unveil um, and and work toward. Um, you know, obviously, public safety, we're off to kind of the side. This is focusing more on those operational administrative um, functions of the city. But I think there's a lot of parallels of what we're doing uh, internally with the PD. And then also kind of being being the person in the room that's that's been here the longest and seen uh, seen a lot of change and, and a lot of structural reorganization. I mean, four years, and, and this is true in, in public safety and the police department specifically, you know, we've, we've focused on, you know, the iceberg above the waterline. We focused on those things, service delivery, calls for service, um, you know, the, the changing dynamic of crime and traffic congestion, all those things, uh, as has the city as well. As Mr. Schnetzer has pointed out many times, uh, and, and probably did so very eloquently uh, when we were talking about the facilities, you know, 20 years of deferred maintenance of everything from sewers to roads, that stands true for the for the operations of the city. We and and speaking from the years of experience here and, and growing up in the organization, lack of funds, all of the environmental concerns, and all everything happening around us. We've been solely focused above the waterline. The, the, the iceberg that, that keeps it stable in the water is all that growth below the waterline and what keeps it stable. The organizational changes and the things that we're doing, everything from working on our national accreditation, which is a, in a, a mammoth uh, undertaking for us, and it, it touches many aspects of the city's operations well beyond that of policing. It touches technology, human resources, finance, even even things like engineering, our school system. Uh, so, so really, that reorg is designed, in in my mind, as I look at it, kind of as a as a one off or or over uh, you know across the parking lot, and hopefully that goes away soon with 825, and we'll no longer say that across the parking lot mantra, which I hate. Um, will be able to focus solely below the waterline, um, kind of developing those synergies that, that uh, Miranda talked about, all the things that intertwine with the things, uh, you, you know, everything. And, and I look at specifically the, the, all of the things that are gonna have to come together and work in unison just to pull this building project off. We have so many things to consider uh, you know everything from from ed energy efficiencies and 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 you know signage and and how we create uh, a, a civic center and focus out of out of this 825 project. It's daunting, uh, but you know again through the work that we're doing across across the parking lot and 
and through our accreditation, it's, it's given me focus in the same things that we need to do in this organizational structure for the entire city. And with that, I yield my time to the mayor. We're gonna yield your time, thank you. All right, I'll bring it home, how's that? So look, ultimately we all have the same goal. We're all here to provide high quality services and high quality of life to our residents uh, and our business community and to do so in a fiscally responsible manner. Um, we need to, in order to do that, we need to have staff in place, staff that is competitively paid, a staff that we can retain, staff that has realistic workloads, and that they have a structure in place that ensures that they can be successful to deliver the high quality of services that we seek to do that. Certainly with issue 12 and with the growth of, uh, in our region due to Intel and, and everything that's coming with it, our projects are expanding both in terms of size uh, and in significance. Um, Ten years ago, we were lucky to fill potholes for a year. Now we're doing major street rebuilds and street resurfacing. Uh, we have a, a, a sidewalk program in which we're going to invest $1.5 million every year for the next how many years so that we can address issues uh, with that. We have trails that need to be built. We have pools that need to be addressed. We have sewers that need to be addressed. As, as both Director Vollmer and Mr. Schultz and Chief Spence have said, for years we have been deferred in maintaining assets that we have in the community. Our staff has been one of them. Right now, the organizational structure is 12 different departments, directors report directly to the mayor. I don't care if you have a mayor, a city manager, a city administrator, you're going to need people underneath that person to help provide a heightened level of oversight and management for all of the projects that are happening within this city. From a macro level, I, I mentioned before just a few weeks ago, I gave, kind of gave a detailed explanation as to what the organizational structure would be in terms of the director, senior director of uh, administrative services, the senior director of operational services, and the deputy director. The two senior directors really would be at a macro level. Uh, the director of uh, senior director of administrative services, if you're looking at that list up there, the citywide strategic plan, the risk and safety program, the diversity, equity, and inclusion program, developing both that internally for our recruiting, hiring, attraction efforts, as well as our external programs, are going to fall on that person. Our director of operational services, senior director, is going to be responsible for the completion of that CIP. Also going to be responsible for the evaluation of operational requirements to new facilities. Right now I have an IT manager who's sitting in front of you who's responsible for overseeing all of the IT needs in this city, including our police department and our communications center as well as all of your laptops and all of our laptops and everything that our, our staff needs to run. In the meantime, he's also the project manager on the largest capital project that we have in this city. He's overseeing the implementation of our very first ever asset management system, which is going to allow us to actually input our street trees. So we have an inventory to start with when we go to develop the, so the street tree program that all of you talked about at length. We don't even have an inventory of those trees. It's going to allow us to create an inventory of our sewers and our maintenance and track our work orders so that we can identify when there's a recurring problem there. He's been working on that for a year. Our plan was to have it, have it launched. August, September of this year, eh, it's a soft launch. Uh, it's getting there, but the external piece of that, which will allow residents to actually go through that system to input work orders, is now pushed back to March or April because he hasn't had time to work on it. I'm, I'm not seeking to create an extra position. I'm seeking to actually put this gentleman in a position in which he's already performing as, at a level at which he should be compensated for the work that he's doing here. Those two senior directors will be at a macro level. The micro level is the deputy director. The deputy director is going to be responsible more for the details, supporting all of the departments and supporting the two senior directors. Everything from, uh, we're talking about the DEI equity inclusion program. One facet of that is incorporating DEI scoring into our RFP bidding contract procedures. But that needs to have oversight. Director Comline can't do that because he's actually running the engineering department and picking the vendors and making sure the construction work gets done. But somebody here needs to make sure that those scorings are happening. That's going to be on the deputy director. Standardizing our RFP process, which is something that we don't have right now, is something that the deputy director will be responsible for. 
looking for outside grant funding opportunities amongst all of the departments. Who need, what, pro, what projects do we have coming up? What outside funding sources can we use? Even if we use a consultant, you need somebody internally to gather that information amongst the different departments, correlate it, and then work with a consultant to fill out the applications, which can be extensive and gruesome in terms of time required. And I know Councilman Renner probably is familiar with that in his own, his own line of work. Uh, Director Vollmer mentioned the procurement, pol the com procurement policy, which is now leading to processes, but somebody has to administer that, and then somebody has to provide the oversight amongst all the departments. And then the interdepartmental workflow to make sure that departments aren't duplicating efforts and that we are aligning not only job functions, but processes to make sure that the processes are aligning and, and again, we're, that we're not having waste uh, so it would be waste reduction, inventory control, and all of those things. So you have macro management and then, and then the micro detail support provided by the deputy director, all of which then go to support the programs and the services that we are being asked to provide to the residents. Does that help? <laughs> Between the four of us. <laughs> Tag team effort there. Um, anything further from council on that particular topic? Yeah, I do. Okay, Mr. But Renner, wanted, then Mr. Weaver. I wanted to make sure, Ms. Bowers, uh, did you have anything in additional? No, I, I mean, as I mentioned, I, I see the value in it, and I just, I, I think that it's important that as we're looking at, you know, this five-year plan, as we're looking at drawing down some of the unreserved fund balance, that we're, we're also able to articulate, I think, exactly what you have done tonight. Um, that why and how these additional positions are going to let us address the below the waterline deferred, uh, deferred in, uh, in, uh, institutional issues that, that we have. Um, so I appreciate um, your articulation on that tonight. And um, I, I appreciate the, the way, you know, the, the, the look at this, right? The way that we're addressing what needs to happen here um, in order to, to, to continue to, to deliver both above the waterline and below the waterline deliverables to the city. Yeah, Mr. Renner. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so I, I want to actually commend everybody uh, for that. that. That was a really nice uh, summation, and I love the way that you actually tied the bow together. I think you are preaching to the choir. It's sort of one of those things that we actually see it, but we're, we're struggling to try to pinpoint and uh, tie a value to it. Um, and I think you've done a, a masterful job of actually helping us at least introducing it that way. Uh, running a department, uh, as I do, uh, one of the things that you're always challenged with is, is like, well, how much work can I get out of one FTE? You know, and if I was building boxes, you know how to build, it's like, okay, and you metric it. It's like, well, today it, you're 10, right? Can we increase that a little bit to 12 boxes a day? Can we? So, but when you're dealing with services and in government and uh, as a service provider, that's a little bit more esoteric, isn't it? it it's not something that's exactly quantifiable. Um, Tom will probably start throwing things at me, but I know from the engineering world that um, we can expect engineers, at least from the private sector, to at least handle six projects at any one given time. I don't know if that's still the standard, but... <laughs> 16 times. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, and so, you know, and that, that actually goes to my point, because that's actually what they're paid in the private sector. But then when you translate over into the public sector, we are really burdened with a, a lot more to do. The human mind is actually given a lot more. So, and I think uh, Mr. Schultz actually uh, really said it, you know, we went from a sleepy hollow um, to something more where we're rising up to the challenges in the 21st century on the eastern side of Franklin County. And you know, given with all the other things that we know um, that are uh, coming to happen, and how do we adapt as a city to rise to those challenges, the, the, the uh, departmental structure, the number of people and all that kind of stuff is actually being challenged and I think uh, you are raising the professionalism inside City Hall to actually to to meet those challenges and I think so we as council I don't uh, I haven't heard anybody actually discounting I think um, what it is is that we're just struggling with trying to understand well, what's that value because we're trained with the public to understand 
dollars and days and that kind of thing. And so um, I think you've given us a little bit more, but if we can get to something, and I hesitate really, I, it, back in the days of yore, we had, uh, and Joanne will know this, we, we had the psalm, and it was a, a, a model for us to understand what the day-to-day business of the city is, and anything above that, it, and Nancy, you'll remember that, um, and it, it helped us, but that was in the days when we were struggling with revenue. We were days in the, you know, when we were just, we didn't, we couldn't even meet the means to do our own roads. Um, and then issue 12 happened, and then now the economic climate happened, and now um, I think, so if we can get to some space esoterically, if we can narrow it down a little bit and um, push to that value proposition, um, I think we'll get closer to something. But again, I, from what I hear from my colleagues, I don't want to put mal- words in everybody's mouths, but I think you're preaching to the choir. Um, and uh, we applaud uh, everything that you're doing. So can, can you help provide some direction then as to what would be, what additional information would be helpful for you? Because we have one more week to provide that to you. Yeah, so if there, I mean, I'll start, Mr. Chair. I, I don't, yeah, you I didn't mean to so. jump. <laughs> it's an open discussion. Sorry. I, if, if we can get to that space where help us um, understand. See, it's, it's, it's intuitively I understand what you're saying, and, I, and intuitively I agree with you, but I need help in drawing a box, if you will. I need help in understanding um, what it is to run the city. And I, what I hear, I think what we all hear is, is that, well, the box is bigger, duh. Okay, let us know what that is in order to provide. You've done, Miranda, you've done a very masterful job tonight giving us a little bit more examples of why we need additional staff to, you know, be program managers to, you know, and Mayor, you even talked about other projects that you're doing. If we can get to something that actually translate at a very high level what that value is that's inside um, and then help us understand in the future years, where is that going? And Joanne, I think you've given us a little bit of that, but if we can understand that. Uh, <laughs> everybody's looking at me like, uh, so I don't know if I'm helping um, enough, but I'm trying to understand what it is that runs the city um, versus uh, a city has a set of services. It's got um, police. We know what your cost is for that uh, and all the other departments. And we're going to say that um, the outputs of those are the parks is programming, right? So I'm not really talking about that because what I'm hearing is that you're building a better infrastructure inside to handle the multitude of things. Going back to what I was saying about having, we used to actually have an individual manage and balance a multitude of things. This is what was always holding us back. We would say, well, why don't we just have people um, create a sidewalk program, you know, in 2017. And then we understood over time what that actually meant. And it was pulling resources away from a multitude of other projects. So I'm just rehearsing back the story that you've told us. So if we can then turn around and point back to, well, in order to properly manage the city, and the numbers are probably all there, uh, what is that, right? And what is it that you're looking at uh, and beyond? You know, is there is there a growth rate that we can actually expect on that? You know, is it a 2%? And, and, and 
again, response to what's happening externally to the city, but you're building a better city hall, a better set of people, what's the value? So what I might add to that, and I just want, I'm seeking clarification to perhaps the mayor's conversation. Um, as an analog in, in, in my day to day, if I have an ask for something, the, you know, typically there is some contractual component and then there are, there's a staffing component to it as well. Meaning, hey, I need this data service comes with a, you know, a nice concise number associated with it. And then, hey, we're building out a platform and we need two software developers or two FTE, you know, to use the, the industry jargon. Um, and then the output of those combined dollars is this thing, right? I think maybe where it's getting a little murky from our vantage point up here on council is there's not just one thing being bolted on to the, to the SOM, or the old, what we used to refer to as a sustainable operating model, right? It was just what does it cost to keep the, the lights on? We have this conjunction of we're making up for 20 years worth of deferred maintenance, in some cases quite literally deferred maintenance, capital. And then, as you all mentioned, there's the, the sort of the human component to it as well. And then we're also doing some new things that are obviously very worthwhile things that will make the community uh, better and so again it might not be quite as clean as a single bolt-on item because we have many bolt-on items listed up there but i don't know if mr renner if that's essentially what you're driving at are you trying to isolate what is our run rate for just the way things are now and then what's the cost of all of that stuff up there is that an accurate way to i guess summarize what you're yeah, trying to drive at the the people cost yeah so again, it, it may not be as, as clear, but I don't know if that analog gives you any direction. I'm getting closer. <laughs> Can I? Sorry. I think I haven't forgotten maybe it. this is how I summarized it. All right. <laughs> Why the positions are needed to support the operations to keep the sitting moving forward and what outputs of the new employees are expected. Is that what some of the things you're looking for are? Say the first part again. Uh, why these internal positions are needed to support operations and keep the city moving forward, and what outputs of the new employees are expected. I don't think that's what he's I don't. I don't think that's what Mr. Renner is driving at. I think that. So, I just I want to step back for a minute and talk about what the purpose of the psalm was and what was kind of going on in that time period, which probably provided a little more information um, that we might be able to to look at that, back at that. So the reason why the SOM came to be was because we didn't have a capital source of funding. The only source of funding we had was the general fund. So we had to create an ability to move some of those general fund dollars over to the capital improvement fund. So that was the main purpose in creation of the SOM, was to say, here's our operations. Based on these operational needs, Here's how much we have available for capital and how are we gonna use these capital dollars. Now that we have a dedicated source of funding, the general fund is our main operating fund. So looking at what is the cost of operations, look at those general fund dollars. There's no more capital running through there. So that's basically that operational SOM is, is there. We also no longer have a need to push those on reserve general fund dollars over to the capital improvement fund. We have a dedicated resource now. The sole purpose of the general fund is on operating the city. So kind of giving some context between what the SOM was intended for and why it was in place and why it's no longer necessary. The other part of that is during that period of time, we were building on the strategic plan where we were trying to pull it into individual departments and kind of report that story back of for each dollar that you budget for me, here's what you're getting. And I think that's what you're referring back to is really when we were talking about those performance measures and really talking about how we were tying in the overall strategic plan of the city and how that correlated to individual dollars budgeted for each department. 
So is that really what you're searching for is kind of those performance indicators that we previously reported that were not really part of the song, but were really part of the overall strategic citywide plan. And as we were kind of pulling those into departments and departments were then creating those plans to show, here's what you give me, here's what you get in return. So to answer your question, yes, that is what I'm searching for. I don't know necessarily that we had the right performance measures, mm -hmm. but yes, that is exactly what I'm, you know, what's our ROI, right? right. And, and the, when I was listening to you speak, you hit the nail on the head um, that the general fund has now actually become purely an operational thing. And so now we've increased, um, we're increasing the labor uh, to actually meet the needs of our operations. And maybe it's, it's more of a look backwards than it is anything else to justify where we are today. But, but with the performance measures, yes. We probably don't have time. No, I, that <laughs> Before I Before this budget is passed, but it is part of our, our goals, I, I, I believe, as we continue working through that citywide strategic plan refresh is to figure out how do we report back to you what those, how we're using those resources and how we're meeting these goals? Um, so we will get back to those, but I, I agree with you. I don't necessarily think that for all departments, what we were reporting out for performance measures was really capturing uh, what was needed. So again, as we work through that process and work with council to figure out what is it that you would like to see us report back to you. For internal facing departments, it's very difficult. I can't tell you that. As, as a supporter of all the other individual departments, it's very hard for me to show with a performance measure how each dollar that you budget for me is used to support each of the individual departments from the finance side. Um, so there, there will be a lot of work involved with that, but we definitely plan on bringing those back to the forefront and determining what those measures are that we're reporting and how it correlates to the budget dollars that we're requesting and other requests um, that we're making as part of each budget cycle. Thank you, Joanne. So Mr. Weaver's been waiting very patiently. Uh. <laughs> All good. Uh, no, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I just want to thank staff, and I want to thank you all for being here and taking the time to not only answer our questions that we submit through the chair, but our sort of impromptu follow-up questions that we have from the dais. This is. Uh, this is a beast and we're, we're doing our best to parse through it and we're grateful for your time and effort that you're that you're spending trying to take um, at least I'll say one lay person and and get me through the process so start with a general thank you um, I also want to say that um, I want staff to have the resources that they need to to serve the city, to serve our residents, to serve the businesses uh, in a meaningful and quality way, as Mr. Schultz uh, hinted at earlier, and uh, as Dr. Uh, Director Burry um, hinted at, um, there are things that we p might possibly want to see that were not included, and um, and, and on that, I do have concerns with the uh, the level of staffing and economic development. Um, I. Given these priorities and the focus on our region with Intel, uh, fastest growing region in the state, um, the need for business attraction and retention, um, at least for the, for the foreseeable past, uh, well, you know, recent past, uh, the director is running a pretty lean shop there. And I know you're making efforts to find, um, find new hires for that role, but I, I, uh, taking the manager down to an administrator, okay, uh, but whether or not there should be another role in that office, um, I think I'm having trouble seeing the job getting done without killing staff. Uh, speaking of the work that one full-time employee can do, um, it, you know, if the job is for 10 boxes, as Mr. Renner said, are we asking them to do 20 boxes? Uh, I appreciate that, Councilman, and I appreciate you not wanting uh, us not wanting to run our 
staff into the ground. Um, what I would say is the staffing projections that we have and the staffing that we request or that we are uh, making to you right now are based on detailed, lengthy discussions with the individual directors and how they see their workloads within their departments and what they as the professionals and experts in their roles believe that they need to fulfill the duties that they have. Uh, with regard to the, the Department of Economic Development, um, Director Strum and Director Vollmer have had extensive conversations, and Director Strum and I have had extensive conversations for that matter, around what he best needs to fit his skill set and complement his skill, skill set and support him for what he, he needs to focus on and what he can pass to other people. Um, so, so what is being asked for right now, even with regard to how we have reclassified the positions, are based on candidate pools, um, what we're seeing coming in from candidates, and again, how we can utilize existing staff to perhaps put some administrative functions you know, in different pockets and then focus on what we best need, what we need to best meet the community needs that we have for economic development as well as support the director in that position. So what's being requested is specifically what Director Strom has identified is what he needs to support his efforts based on his experience that he's had in his career thus far. And Director Volmer, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or not. Um, I think um, economic development and other departments as well. I think I mentioned it last week when I did the staffing report. Um, after we'll just use economic development since it's only much after Director Strum hires two new people, onboards those individuals, that'll be in reality all of next year. But if somewhere down the line uh, Director Strum identifies a need that he needs XYZ assistance with, we'll first look to internal staff to see if there's anybody else who either has those skills or has time to do that. If not, I, I mentioned it last time, but we could come back to this body and request a supplemental for another position. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about engineering projects. Director Kamlik and I just had a conversation today. But you, you, you very much could see any director coming back before this body and asking for additional staff if it necessitates that. But at the current time, based on the current um, projects we have in the existing and in the pipeline, the presentation and the staffing um, that we're requesting for next year is what we're recommending um, based on those conversations. And Mr. Weibensinger and I started, I believe, in mid-June having those conversations internally um, to really vet out what is needed, what is current staff doing, how can we cross-functionally use people, what are people's skill sets to move them around to, to be the most efficient, to get the best quality out of um, employees for the residents. So it seems like this has mushroomed a bit. I don't know if there's anything before we move on to you know other questions or other discussion items, just with regard to, I guess, staffing and service deliverables, et cetera. Anything else from council? Well, you mean on this topic with, with the administration before? Yeah. Okay. This particularly this topic. And again, what, what originally started down as question number two. No. <laughs> OK. When else are we going to talk about it? It's fine. I'm just <laughs> trying to provide some organization or structure to the discussion. Um, so the next prepared question we have is uh, question three. The special revenue funds have accumulated fund balances since they were first established following the passage of issue 12. Uh, the question is, is, are there any possibilities for the reassignment of expenses in the upcoming fiscal year um, to special revenue funds that could draw on these fund balances and um, preserve general fund balance and for reference this is on page or pages not 39 and 40. I'm gonna assume Joanne that one's directed to you. Yes um, so what we're trying to do is trying to avoid continually moving things in and out of the general fund and the special funds. It has a huge impact on the comparability from year to year and it also creates an inability for us to look at new programs, new activities that maybe those special funds can take on. So for this particular year, we are planning on using 625,000 of special revenue fund balances. Um, that still leaves a, a pretty healthy fund balance in all of them. Um, and then we're gonna look at what else can we do into the future as we hit each budget cycle. So not merely just pushing existing programs into these funds, but really how can we make a value add 
impact with these dollars. Um, for 2023, there are some new items that are included in there, the mental health clinician, uh, the recreation supervisor, but we have some additional contract services coming from engineering. Um, so we already identified some new items for 2023. Um, so based on this, we don't really believe that there should be any items moved from the general fund into those special funds as we look to the future and looking at those funds to, to bring some new programs and potentially some new activities on board. And we are using, we are drawing down on the fund balance uh, for 2023. Thank you. Anything further from council on that? Specifically uh, special revenue funds and their associated fund balances? I have a question. Mrs. McGregor. I think that's, um, the, the balances maybe are high, except that this was, when we, when we proposed issue 12, it was supposed to last for 20 years. And so even though it may be high now, as we go through time, they're going to draw more from that. We're going to need more. So it may be high now, but as, as time goes on, it's not going to be. And to, to try to spend all of it now would seem to me to be unwise when I it's got to last what we said it would last 20 years, whether it really does or not. But I mean, we should work towards that goal. But that was what we said when we passed the income tax increase. Anything further from council on that topic? Okay. So um, I don't have the question printed out in front of me, but I believe the gist of um, a follow-up question that was received is just if the administration would be prepared to discuss uh, performance measures or provide a performance measure overview for the public service department. You yeah, so that one was kind of hard for us to address since we don't actually have a director of public service right now. Um, so. What I can do is, again, give some history on those performance measures and what their purpose was. Again, the purpose of them was to say, uh, for every dollar that you budget for me, here are the activities that I'm going to accomplish. And the performance measures were used as a gauge, as a, have we met our goals? Did we reach our, our results? Um, so my assumption is uh, that those are looked at by each director that is reporting them from year to year to say, am I meeting my goal? Am I getting the resources to keep those performance measures, those goals that I said that I would, I would maintain? Or am I not meeting my goal? And is it because I need additional resources or is it because we need to look at how we're programming things? Um, so that is my, my assumption is that when that budget was put together, are they meeting those goals within those performance measures? And if they weren't, do they need additional resources? Or if they are meeting their goals, status quo until the next year because they have the resources they need and they're maintaining what they needed to maintain. Thank you, Joanne. Anything from council on that? Mr. Chair. Mr. Thank Reaver. You. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I, I think for me, um, and, and maybe, maybe not this evening, because um, I certainly understand it's a difficult question to answer. I, I think it'd be helpful in terms, certainly there's the, there's a drop off in a lot of the departments in terms of performance measures for 2020. And as we're, we were all trying to figure out how to, how to navigate our, our, the pandemic. But I think it'd be helpful to, uh, at some point, go through those measures um, and, and sort of see the progressions in those numbers um, and what they actually mean in terms of perhaps the ROI that Mr. Renner was getting at um, earlier if that helps clarify it all. And again, perhaps not this evening. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Anything further from council on that topic? So that is, that is all I have as far as prepared um, questions. We have a discussion item that was proposed um, for members of council and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe essentially the, the gist of it was uh, swapping our subscription to the National League of Cities to a subscription um, for Columbus Business First. Do I have that correct? Um, more or less. Um, NLC is a membership kind of um, uh, it's at the National League of Cities versus somewhat akin to OML, Ohio Municipal League, just at the national level. Um, I had proposed uh, joining NLC. I, I would propose now that we terminate the membership for 2022, 2023. 
Um, and I think instead, uh, yes, business, Columbus Business First subscriptions for council members would be more useful. So I wanted to bring that before council and see if we were amenable to that. I know Jeremy pulled um, the numbers, and I think it's, it would be a cost savings to the office significantly. A, well, a couple you thousand dollars. On, would you like me to comment on that? Yeah. Please, okay. Mr. Van yeah, so it, it's actually a timely discussion. We just received an invoice for next year's membership. Um, so because of how their membership cycles roll and their billing, we were invoiced um, 3613 for next year's membership, which is an amount already budgeted in this fiscal year. So if the inclination or the desire is to um, not move forward even next year into renewing membership, I won't go ahead and pay this cycle's um, membership as well. Um, that said, uh, I did uh, have Pam find out through Columbus Business First what sort of offerings they have. They have kind of a tiered structure. Um, uh, it's, it's called Office Pass and per seats, it's about, if you're looking at just council, $125 per seat. So 3,615 for something that, you know, might be nice to have published that, hey, we're a member of National League of Cities, but are we getting a lot, enough bang for our buck in terms of the, the services um, versus the information and, and utility of Columbus Business First? So the question I have is, what was the what was the basis or justification driving the National League of Cities um, subscription? Kind of what was the goal there? And it sounds like it's not being met, whatever it was. But I was curious what what ultimately was being uh, hoped I, for. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea was uh, that it would have uh, information that would be communicated out to members um, and resources communicated out to members. Uh, kind of like how uh, OML both advocates at the at the state level, NLC advocates at the at the federal level for municipal uh, policies, policies that benefit municipalities. Um, in addition to that, providing resources to to its municipal members. Um, I didn't. I don't. I don't. We're not. I don't believe we're using it, and I don't know that that it necessarily makes sense for us to continue to use to to, to maintain that membership, but. Um, if people think that they may continue to use NLC or, or other people may use NLC's resources, then, you know, certainly it's not a huge budget item. Uh, but I, I, I uh, wasn't using them. <laughs> so. uh, anything from council on that topic item? NLC, Columbus yeah. Business First, just any thoughts in general? Yeah, Mrs. McGregor. Years ago, we used to send... Um, People used to go to the, the conventions they had, and um, uh, not everybody went every year, but a couple people would go every year. And I went a couple of times, but it, I mean, it was fun to go, but you really didn't learn anything because everything was geared towards large cities. And even the small cities, they said, we well, need to go to the small cities. Even the small things, cities were like 75 to 100,000 people, and the things and programs they had we're not like they were they one of the things was on bed bug eradication or something like that you know it's like we don't really have that a program to address that's not something we even deal with and so the programs they had were not really applicable to it, it was interesting to go but it, it re really didn't learn anything I didn't feel that was mine and they you know even like I said even the small cities were much larger than things programs they had were not applicable at all to things that going on in Gahanna, a city our size. Is there a, a view or an opinion that OML is, I mean, the NLC versus OML, one, they're, they're essentially redundant? I mean, is OML, no, it's not the argument being made? No, I don't think it's necessarily redundancy. It's just a matter of, I think that we, we use the resources offered by OML um, and that they push out information that I think is relevant for us to have on our radar. Um, NLC is really more at the, you know, it's more at the federal level and what federal policies are impacting municipal municipalities. Mm -hmm. But I'm not seeing that information communicated out to us in this, like, in as effect, is as in an as effective way as OML communicates the information sure. to us. If you want to give it another year on NLC and see if, you know, you know, if somebody else wants to kind of 
take a look at what we're getting from NLC and see if it's worth maintaining. Um, but no, no, I guess the the thought behind the question was, you know, we get the you're right, we get the call to action emails from the OML, and I've followed up on some of those. Yeah, um, exactly. In fact, some of them they're not all pertaining to necessarily the state house down on you know. Um, at broad and high, some of them are, are at the federal level, and, and you know I signed on to letters and made phone calls to senators and Congress people just to kind of share the city's perspective. Um, so I, my view is is the OML has value. I'm with you. Can't recall any sort of a call to action from the NLC that's at least spurred me to to do anything. Um, so I have no issue not renewing it for 2023. But I guess the, the next sort of logical follow on is what's the value proposition behind Columbus Business First or what's the what's the need or justification for not just canceling but switching? Yeah, so uh, there have been a number of articles that Gahanna has been featured in and Columbus Business First I'm finding is one of uh, the local pieces of journalism that is reporting on development and uh, regional uh, development issues, regional journalism, uh, in a way that I don't necessarily think the dispatch uh, does all the time. Um, and I think that it's important that as council members we stay informed uh, as, to, as to what's going on regionally and Columbus Business First is certainly covering those, those regional issues, not just here in Gahanna, but um, across central Ohio. So I think it would be of value for us to stay informed and for us to have that that information ready at hand. I have noticed recent, just recently too, that um, most of most of the articles are behind a paywall. So I am I've not been able to access a lot of them recently. That's been the extent of my experience. Is somebody mentions, hey, we're doing this really cool thing in the city of Gannett. You should go check it out, and you get you know three sentences, and uh -huh. then it, then it prompts you to sign in. Um, but but what? What I'll say is that's the limit of my experience. I don't know what else they have behind the paywall. So I guess I'm just asking if anyone has experience with it. I don't know if you do. All right, Mr. Renner, maybe I could just share what we might expect to get out of it beyond, hey, we're doing something cool in Creekside and here's an article about it. Yeah. So um, I've, I've mentioned this before, uh, that I have my own personal subscription to Columbus Business First. I, I've paid for it out of my own pocket. Um, it's something that, uh, a subscription that I've had for uh, many years. Um, the, um, what's the value proposition is actually, it gives you uh, the lay of the land. I think Ms. Powers actually succinctly says it about the level of journalism um, that provides you. It is business specific um, and uh, it, it's not, you know, Gahanna is not the only uh, city or municipality by any means whatsoever. It does give you a larger view of central Ohio uh, and even the greater uh, sense of that. Um, I will tell you that uh, if you think you're going to read everything and every issue, that's not going to be um, really optimal <laughs> uh, unless you have lots and lots of time. Um, but uh, if you are ferrying it out, uh, you know, you will, if you put in filters or something like that, you, you will get, you know, what you return for any uh, magazine subscription or newspaper, you know, what have you. Um, I, I don't know if that answers the question or... Um, it does also provide a... Um, Something that's sort of unique to Columbus Business First, it does provide ranking of area businesses, but again, these are largely, most of the time, not Gahanna, uh, but it's, you know, uh, where does Cardinal Health fit in the grand scheme of things? Where does AEPs fit in the grand scheme of things? Um, or maybe the top 50 engineering firms in Central Ohio, um, that type of thing. Um, uh, that's and it's that is unique to Columbus Business First. Uh, you also have uh, once you have a subscription, you do have access to other things online. Um, there are sometimes interviews that are some interesting. Does anybody else in the city have access to this? I mean, I'm assuming does Nate have it? Madam Mayor, do you have access I have a, to it? 
there's a subscription that runs through the mayor's office, um, okay. and uh, Director Strum could have a separate subscription as well because you have to pay for each person who accesses sure. it in order to get the full accessibility. It's a higher rate. The challenge that we have is if you want to perhaps share an article online so that everybody can read it, you have to pay every time you do that, and the, the rate is not an inexpensive one. Okay. Um, I'm personally not opposed to giving it a try. and I guess we'll see. I, I'm not chomping at the bit personally. I, I'm, I'm In my just day job, I'm awash in information. Um, there's more stuff out there than I have, like you said, Mr. Renner, time to read. Um, so I don't necessarily, as one individual, have to have a seat. Um, but if others are, you know, if others see value in it, uh, and it's already in the budget, I don't, I'm not necessarily opposed to others pursuing that. But from my vantage point, I don't know that I would use it enough to justify the cost. But that's just me. So maybe if. I mean, I don't think anything actually has to change in the budget. This is just really an internal dialogue. So maybe if those of us who would like Jeremy to sign us up can just let Jeremy know, just like we do with conferences and things like that, is that a suitable way to go? All right. And if you don't opt in, then you won't have a subscription. Fair enough. Okay. Yes? Okay. That makes sense. Works for me. Um, so that is the last thing I had on the agenda uh, as far as kind of guiding the conversation. We have one more formally scheduled committee meeting for the year, and then I believe our anticipated date to vote slash pass the budget is uh, December 19th. Um, is there, are there any lingering items? I don't know, Miranda, you were jotting down some notes, and, and I think there was some questioning going back and forth with uh, President Renner. I mean, are we, as a council, expecting them to come back with anything for committee? We anticipating asking additional questions that need to be submitted to the administration. I guess I'm just saying, are we comfortable with the budget? We're ready to go. Just looking for guidance as far as what's the will of council here. We can always schedule it, and if there's no questions, we could just not. If there aren't questions, then we don't have a meeting. It would be like it would be Monday or right after. It's next Monday. And I'll have the 2023 salary and benefits ordinances as well for committee of the whole next week that incorporate these staffing requests in the budget requests. So I just want to be clear, there is no follow-up being asked from council with regard to the budget as things stand right here right now. But I should basically keep my email open and close in case something pops in that I'm hearing. Mr. Chair. Um, yeah. So there's no uh, immediate follow-up on the budget per se, but uh, what I did hear is like a commitment to developing some uh, extra tools, you know, longer term, not with inside 2022. Is that what I heard? Okay. Yeah, and so I, to answer your earlier question, I have great confidence that this is the budget uh, going forward. There might be little nits here and there, you know, asking a question for clarification. Um, but uh, I see no reason not to proceed. Okay. Just one last time for it is to be abundantly clear. No formally scheduled or nothing formally coming back from the administration as things stand right now. However, if we receive additional questions, I'll route those to the administration and then we'll schedule a finance committee for next week. Otherwise, the budget looks good for the 19th. Okay. Thank you all. Thus concludes finance. Thank you.